I work for the Brazilian government here for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the United Nations Division. Uh, we're very glad that you're here to welcome the UN outreach team. We have fought very hard to bring them and they very graciously accepted to come to talk to you a little bit about the UN selection process. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Marta, who will be speaking to, for us today. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for having us. And thank you to each and every one of you. Are all of you working? So you came from work, and you're going to spend two hours and a half with us. Right? Yes? Good. All right, so we, we, we'll try to make it as fun, as interactive as possible, because we are sure that you are a bit tired. But the fact that you have come really makes a difference. So my name is Martelena Lopez. I joined the UN uh, system nearly 30 years ago. I started with the World Food Program uh, through a vacancy announcement. And uh, very rarely uh, I applied for that vacancy and I got the job. Uh, some of us uh, had to apply to quite a number of vacancies in order to get the job. After a few years in the World Food Program, I moved to UNICEF. Uh, does everyone know where you, uh, what UNICEF, about UNICEF? Yes? Then I w moved to the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, and we have here uh, one other member of the team that is currently working um, in UNDP and another member who used to work in UNDP. And then since 2004, I am in the UN Secretariat. I am a lawyer by background, and um, I think I will finish there. Each one of us, as we come on, we will introduce ourselves and tell you how we join. So this evening, what we are going to do is we are going to give you a presentation on the different careers of opportunities in the UN system and how, how you can apply for them. Then we will give you some tips on how to apply for the UN system. As in any other company, you need to prepare an application. However, you need to know certain features that are important for us in order to join the UN. And then we are going to give you some uh, tips and some recommendations for an interview. So who likes job interviews here? Uh, who doesn't like them? <laughs> OK, the bad news. In order to get a position with us or in the outside world, you normally have to go for an interview. So we're going to work on it. And we're going to try for you to love them as we go along. And next time you go to an interview, with us all in the outside world. I hope you remember all our faces. And then we'll open it to questions and answers. Is it clear? You still with us? All right, so um, here, oh, and then uh, finally, the presentations are going to be posted in the uh, web page of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So if you don't take all the notes, don't worry. What we need is your full concentration. So all the presentations will be posted next week on the website. So like that, you can really uh, uh, concentrate on what we are um, speaking to you. So in here, in the two uh, screens, you have the map of the world. And there you have indicated all the different UN system organizations, funds and programs, UNDP, UNFPA, specialized agencies, WHO, UNF, um, uh, WMO, uh, and other FAO, for example. And then you also have the Bretton Woods organizations that are based in, um, in Washington. Uh, the difference between them is that, except for the Bretton Woods organizations, we all have the same conditions of service, the same salaries, the same allowances. The Bretton Woods organizations the bank and IFD have a different compensation package, but they are part of the UN system. The reason why we are presenting this is because depending on your background, we encourage you to explore opportunities not only in the UN Secretariat, not only in UNDP, not only in UNFPA, but any of the organizations in the UN system. So you can open your doors a bit more. 
Some organizations are very headquarter centric. Most of the positions are in one location. Like for example, the meteorological organization, which is one of the oldest one in the UN system. It was established in the 1860s. They are mainly based in Geneva. They have very few positions outside Geneva. However, all of us here, we have positions globally around the world. Is it clear? No. What are the career options? Um, in the UN system, we have international staff positions. We have locally recruited staff positions. We have temporary positions. And we have other another group of um, uh, uh, ways that you can contribute to the UN. Today, mainly, what we are going to concentrate are in those positions that are for professionals that have more than five years of experience and that normally are advertised by the different organizations. But we will touch on the others because you may know of people that may be interested. So it may not be you, it may be others. Like for example, the Young Professionals Program, uh, Lynn will be speaking to you about it. You may meet the requirements, but it's very likely that you know other individuals or you have family members that are interested. We also have language positions, and those are for interpreters and translators. And it covers not only the UN Secretariat, but also your, um, UNESCO and FAO, and also the Bretton Woods organizations. And um, besides that, we have individual contractors and consultants, and we will be touching a bit on the UNB program. So those are mainly the different ways of joining the UN. Who we are? Lynn, Susan, Mary, and Harold start knowing their names, and myself. We are international civil servants. Uh, we have not one boss, which is one country. We have all the countries of the world are our bosses. So in the case of the UN Secretariat, we have 193 member states. So we serve the 193 member states. We cannot take directions of any specific country. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we have some members here for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, their members are also civil servants, but they are national civil servants. They serve the Brazilian government. So we are all civil servants, but our angle is international. Uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or any of your ministries, it's national. Uh, in the case of the UN Secretariat, we work, as I said before, we work throughout the world. And also, we have a good number of individuals working for us. Our workforce uh, starts with around 44,000 staff members. We have more than uh, 40,000 uh, individual consultants every year. And then uh, Susan will be speaking to you a bit more later on all our troops that are contributing to our peacekeeping operations. And at one, any point in time, they could um, go up to 100,000. And Brazil has been one of the great contributors of those uh, troops serving in some of our missions. What do we do, um, continue? Where we are? Uh, we are globally, as I said, all of us that are represented here. But some of you may be interested in organizations where you will not have to travel globally or will not have to serve globally. So then you will have to look at those organizations that are small organizations. IMO, the Maritime Organization, is in London. They are uh, dedicated to the maritime issues. They are a small organization, but most of the positions are in London. Or some of the others are globally around the world. What can you do for us? So throughout the UN system, UN Secretariat, UNDP, UNFPA, UNESCO, FAO, WFP, UNHCR, WHO, ILO, we are all looking for IT individuals. We are looking for uh, legal experts. We are looking for communications experts, public information. We are all looking for administrators. We are all looking for procurement experts. So if you have that background, we encourage you to look at every single organization. However, some of us have more specialized areas also. Demography. UNFPA looks for demographers, we look for demographers. 
but UNDP will not look for demographers. WHO, the World Health Organization, will very likely not look for demographers. We look for cartographers. We are the only organization that looks for cartographers. Electoral affairs experts. UNDP looks for electoral affairs experts. UNOPS, which is another of our organization, looks, and the UN Secretariat. So there are three. So as uh, uh, in summary, there are some areas that cover across all the UN system organizations, but there are some areas, and depending on your background, that you may be more restricted, and therefore there are only a few or some that you will be able to apply. Is it clear? What we want to stress uh, here is that in the UN Secretariat, it goes from an IT expert to someone who is expert in, um, in aviation, for example. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Susan. And Susan is going to introduce herself and give you a gist of how she joined the UN. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Susan Huntington, and I originate from the United Kingdom, uh, but I currently work for the United Nations in New York in uh, what we call the Department of Field Support. And the Department of Field Support is charged with uh, managing and overseeing the human resources, um, financial and logistic provisions to all of the peacekeeping and special political missions in the field. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about peacekeeping operations and special political missions, and then explain a little bit about how you may all fit into our field operations. I can probably bet that every single person in this room, almost, could play a part in our field operations somehow. Um, so right now, we have 15 peacekeeping operations uh, and 12 special political missions. And we have one mission that is both a political mission and a peacekeeping operation at the same time. And that mission is in Afghanistan. Uh, we've just opened our newest peacekeeping operation uh, in Mali. And does anybody know the difference between a peacekeeping mission and a special political mission? I would imagine not. Okay. Well, the United Nations doesn't have its own uniformed personnel, military and police. So we rely on the kind contributions of member states like Brazil to provide us with police and, and military troops. A peacekeeping mission will have a uniform presence. It's usually in a country that is currently going through a conflict or is emerging from a conflict but is still quite unstable. Whereas a special political mission doesn't have a uniform presence and is based in countries where the conflict is probably a little longer gone. It's much more stable environment compared to peacekeeping missions. But the operations themselves tend to be a little bit more smaller than peacekeeping missions. So the peacekeeping missions are big, dynamic, robust, sometimes a little uh, based in conflict situations, where the special political missions are smaller in a little bit more stable environment, yet still dynamic and very interesting to work in. Uh, we uh, operate mostly in the African continent. That seems to be the greatest saturation of, uh, uh, sorry, concentration of where our missions are. Uh, we have an operation in Haiti, and we have some operations in the Middle East and Asia. Uh, we did have an operation in, in Timor-Leste, where your Portuguese would have come in very useful. Um, but we do have a mission in Guinea-Bissau as well, which is obviously Portuguese speaking. Um, our total personnel in the field, it obviously fluctuates, but it, it's somewhere around 115,000 civilians, national officers, those are uh, staff of the country that we have our missions in, and uniformed personnel. We have a very big budget because we're a, a huge part of the organization. Um, we're probably half of the size of the, the UN Secretariat. And our budget is about seven to eight billion dollars per year. Um, we, our biggest peacekeeping mission right now is in Darfur, and we have around 25,000 people there. And it's actually, in terms of size, I believe it's our third largest duty station. So it, it, it's a huge operation. And it's also a hybrid mission. 
that we run in conjunction with the African Union. So I don't want to spend too much time telling you about the history of peacekeeping and special political missions, um, but we have seen some change in recent years, especially since the time that I joined around eight years ago. Peacekeeping was a little more traditional back then, and, and now it's definitely changed. It's much more multidimensional, and that means that there's different parts of the organization coming together in the environment where the operations are taking place, and they're all interacting with each other. Um, so, for example, if we take South Sudan, you know, we have a peacekeeping presence there, but we also have the presence of the UNDP country office, which Mari is representing, uh, UNICEF, FAO, WFP. So it's many parts of the organization coming together in a very uh, multidimensional way to implement the mandates that came out of the Security Council. Um, we also have missions where um, uh, we are the only actors on the ground, usually in very small locations. They're very small missions, maybe only 50 people. So we can either work alone, or for the most part, we can work as part of a UN country team with all of the different parts of the UN coming together, trying to implement the mandate. So as I said to you, I believe that there's many people in this audience who could join us in some way or another. And in the, in the peacekeeping operations and the special political missions, these are the kind of occupational group clusters that you could potentially fit into. In every operation that we have, there's two sides to it. There's the substantive side, which is your political affairs officers, your civil affairs officers, human rights, humanitarian affairs. And then we have what's called the mission support side of the, the operations. And that's usually the largest component. And if you think about it, these are such robust, huge operations that we need people on a day-to-day -day basis running them. We need aviation specialists and logisticians, procurement experts, human resources officers, finance officers, budget officers, legal officers. So there's so many different areas that candidates like yourself could potentially fit into. Because our environments are a little bit more challenging, we're probably looking for somebody with at least five years of experience in one of these areas. The most important thing, though, I believe, for the field is your motivation to serve there. You know, it, it's, it's no piece of cake. You have to be willing to leave your family, move overseas, work in an environment where you don't have those little luxuries in life, but you're there and you're on the ground and you're in the environment where the conflict has taken place and you're integrating with the nationals of that country, trying to make it a better place. So it's a very, very worthwhile uh, job. We go about recruiting people for the peacekeeping and the, the special political missions a little bit differently to the, to the other parts of the Secretariat. We build rosters. So periodically, throughout the year, we'll advertise a generic job opening, a GJO, where we define the generic skills and experience that you would need in order to perform the role in the field, plus the competencies that we would expect from you. And as candidates, you have usually between 15 to 60 days to apply, maybe once or twice a year, and we'll assess your application, and if you're successful, we'll place you onto a roster. And I think it's worthwhile even if you're not willing to go to the field right now, or you just don't feel ready, or it's not the best time in your life, I still believe it's worth you applying. Because if you're successful and you get onto the roster, you're on there indefinitely. So at any point in time in the future, if we pick up the phone to you and say, hey, Paola, would you like to go and serve in Cote d'Ivoire? You know, you can say, oh, yes, Susan, I'm ready now. Please, let's go. Or, no, thank you. Now's not the right time. My wife's about to have a baby. Um, but I think it's worthwhile to get yourself onto the roster, so at least you open that opportunity for when the time's right for you. Um, when we feel as though we can't find anybody on our rosters, we'll issue what we call a, spe a position-specific job opening, a PSJO. That means we've looked at our rosters and we really can't see anybody who has the particular skills and criteria for the mission that we're recruiting for. Maybe it's a very complex mission. Maybe it's a very complex role. Maybe it's a very hard mission and nobody's willing to go there. 
So we'll, from time to time, we'll announce these position-specific job openings where we'll actually announce the duty station in question rather than the generic approach. And you should also check the website to look for those because we do, we do issue them from time to time throughout the year. And now I'm going to pass you over to my colleague who's going to talk to you about another way to get your foot into the door, which is the language exam. Okay. All right, so before I speak about the language exam, Susan uh, uh, explained to you a bit what uh, our missions, where our missions are, what do they do and not do. And this is just a gist of one portion of the UN Secretariat. And we do have a good number of other departments and offices, political affairs, economics affairs, general assembly, um, conference uh, services, we do have regional commissions. So uh, there's a broad opportunity throughout the UN Secretariat, but today we wanted to give you a big gist of the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, as that is one of our largest uh, pool of talent where we are looking for, and it is the largest number of staff members that we have. Uh, on that note, and uh, before I turn it over to UNDP and UNFPA, we wanted to bring to your attention the language examinations. Anyone at an interpreter, a translator here? Good. And does the others have any friends that may be potential candidates? Perhaps? Yes. So in the UN Secretariat, uh, as I said, UNESCO, FAO, and the Bretton Woods organizations, we are always looking for individuals with very good language skills. And the requirements for this position are more stricter in the language skills than others. In the case of the UN Secretariat, to be an interpreter, to be a translator, we do require the individual to have a full command of three of the official languages. English, French, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, or uh, Russian. So you do need to have that command. But that is for the language positions. That requirement does not apply for the positions, for example, that Susan has just indicated. We are not so strict in that. And therefore, all the others, while languages are required, we don't require the three languages. Is it clear? The command has to be very good because at one point in time, for example, an interpreter will be expected to interpret in the Security Council. So the command of the language has to be excellent. For these positions, we do uh, have an exam and those exams are advertised in our website and they are periodically uh, refreshed as we go through the different rosters. The requirements, you have to be to take the exam 55 years of age or younger. You do have to have a university degree. It does not have to be a university degree in interpretation. It does not have to be a university degree in translation. You can have any degree. You can be a lawyer. You can be an architect. The important is that you have the university degree and the command of the three languages. And in addition, for the interpretation, you have to prove that you have done interpretation for 200 full days. It can be as a freelance or it can be with a company or others. So that are the requirements for the language examination. In certain opportunities, we do require Portuguese. And for example, last year we did have a, an announcement for radio producers in Portuguese. That is extremely rare. I do have to stress that the majority, that the 99% uh, is for the six official languages. So on that note, now I'm going to have the pleasure of having now uh, Mary with us. And Mary works in UNDP. And that's where I came before. And uh, it's a wonderful organization, just to let you, uh, where I am now, I wouldn't be if I had not moved through the different organizations. Each organization is different, although we all share very similar principles, but we learn different things from each one of them. So over to you, Mary. Hi, everybody. My name is Mari Pesonen. I'm originally from Finland, and I've been with uh, UNDP now for almost two years. 
Uh, I'm based in New York and I work there in the Office of Human Resources in, um, in recruitment and outreach matters. And uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the, with the UN opportunities, but I'm a junior professional officer at JPO, which means I'm actually sponsored by, by Finland for my employment. And just a few words about my background um, to show you the variety of profiles that we have in the UN system. I actually um, studied political science and international affairs, but I've ended up working in, in HR, which I very much enjoy. So one of the key messages or takeaways from, uh, from this, um, uh, this meeting or this, uh, this discussion today is to, to look broadly into the opportunities that there are in the, in the UN system. Uh, a few words about our mandate. As the name says, we obviously have the mandate for social and economic development in the UN system. And we really work with the governments and communities in the field on their own solutions. We offer advice to governments, for example, how to use their, um, their development aid. And lots of the work we do is very specialized in nature. We are one of the, or the um, most spread out UN agency. We are operating in 177 countries and territories. So wherever the UN is, is present, we are there. And UNDP also coordinates the resident coordinator network. So the, um, the, the representative of UNDP also works as the representative of the, the coordinator of the whole UN system in lots of the countries. We are a big organization. We are more than 8,000 staff members. And in addition, we have thousands of consultants working for us. As international professional staff, meaning staff that rotates to, to different countries and are not based in their own country, we are more than 2,000. So about 6,000 are actually national officers or general uh, local staff. So in, in here in Brazil, we have Brazilians working in our country office, but then we also have international staff. Then the consultants, we really have consultants everywhere in, in, in headquarters in New York, also in the field. And I'm going to tell a few words about the consultancies as well. What we do, we really operate in, in very various areas. Um, our job families are divided into the practice areas that we have. We have poverty reduction, democratic governance, crisis prevention and recovery, environment and energy, HIV AIDS. And as you can see, these areas overlap with some of the other mandates of other UN agencies. For example, UNFPA, we work on many similar issues, but what UNDP does is it really works with the governments and it works in advisory positions. So lots of the times we operate at the background. So although we work in women's empowerment, you and women might be doing the same thing, but from a different angle. Also, in all the things that we do, we encourage women's empowerment, and then we build capacities in the, in the field, on the ground. We have career opportunities in all these practice areas, and in addition, we have lots of career opportunities in management areas. In operations, such as in, in HR, where I work, we have multiple opportunities, also in IC, ICT, audit, legal. Majority of our positions are in the field. We are a very field-based organization since we, we work for development. We operate in the field. So it makes sense that 80% of our jobs are actually there in the field. One of our major countries is Afghanistan. It's much easier to get a job in Afghanistan than it's in New York. And if you're flexible, in terms of going to a hardship duty station, such as Afghanistan or Iraq or South Sudan, it's much easier to, um, to get an opportunity there. Most of our jobs require at least five years of experience because of the, the specialized nature that we have. And in addition to the staff positions, we have lots of consultancies in UNDP. These consultancies can vary from two weeks working on a report and submitting it to uh, to, to an office, to, uh, to a year project. In, um, there are so many different areas. And all these opportunities, the staff positions and the consultancies, everything is advertised on our job site. And we're going to have a look at it later on when, when we talk about how to apply in the, uh, the whole system. We're going to show a snapshot of our, of our job site. All the positions that we have are advertised there, consultancies, national positions, 
and the international positions. And the national positions are also advertised on the, on the local websites. So if you're interested in working for UNDP here in Brazil, you should also check out the, um, the website of the, the country office of Brazil. And just a few words still about the, the job site is one of the key things for UNDP is that we advertise our, our jobs mostly only for two weeks. Sometimes it's only for a week. So we have a really high turnover of jobs. We have about three to 400 jobs every single month. Today we had 100 and 189 positions open. Next week, half of them will be different. So if you're interested in working for UNDP, my best advice is to check the website each week you know, make a routine out of it because there's a, there's a really high turnover of positions. So it could be that you miss one if you don't visit every month. And uh, with this, I'm just going to pass the floor to, to my colleague from UNFPA. And then later on, if you have any questions about uh, UNDP, feel free to ask me in the Q&A session. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Good afternoon. Good, good evening to each one of you. My name is Harold Robinson, and I work for UNFPA. Um, um, I want to, by the end of the session, hopefully get a lot of you to understand what UNFPA does. I know a couple of people in the audience who already know, and uh, also get you excited about the possibilities of working with UNFPA. Uh, UNFPA is not, it's not a very uh, known organization except for the particular people with which we, we work. And UNFPA is an international organization, a, a, a technical cooperation agency of the UN that basically is, 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 has the, the goal of assisting countries uh, to build that world in which we, 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 each pregnancy is wanted, um, every, every, chi every childbirth is safe, and young people have, are able to fulfill their potential. Um, let me tell you a little, before I continue, let me tell you a little bit about me. I am originally from Costa Rica, and I have been with the UN for 22 years. I have worked with UNFPA. I went to UNF, U, UNDP, and I came back to UNFPA. I, have, I am currently based in Brazil, and I'm responsible for the programs and offices in Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. And this is my seventh uh, assignment, meaning that I have moved around in seven different uh, locations. Um, in terms of exactly how UNFPA operates, what, what do we do? We basically provide technical cooperation in these areas, population data to reduce poverty. And I'm sure all of you uh, uh, feel the, the IVG uh, questionnaire a couple of years ago about the census. I'm sure all of you participated in the census. Well, UNFPA is the organization that provides field assistance. There's, there's other UN entities, but we provide field assistance to the countries in terms of, of, of the census. And that comes under that population data to reduce poverty. Uh, in terms of uh, pregnancies, basically we're speaking about the ability of couples and women to decide when they want to have children, the spacing of those children, and, and, and how often. Will they, will they want to have, uh, uh, and the total number of children. But, uh, every birth is safe, ensuring that pregnant women have access to, to, to uh, health services during their pregnancies and during uh, delivery. Um, within the UN, we have responsibility for, uh, we are one of the focal points for prevention of HIV, and we do that particularly as part of the UN AIDS uh, arrangement, which is a common program and we focus on prevention for youth, especially for young people and girls. And uh, we also um, work on one of the key uh, development priorities of the UN, which is basically achieving gender equality, and that last bullet point about ensuring that every girl and woman is treated with dignity and respect co uh, talks to, to that. And more and more, uh, UNFPA, I believe in the last seven years or so, has been involved in more and more in humanitarian context, working in these other, in, in, in these other areas. Um, we are a relatively uh, say smaller organization with a total of about uh, 2,300 uh, staff members worldwide, but we also have a range of other, of other modalities of, 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 of contracts. Just like UNDP, we are field-based, as you see 
Only 300 people are in New York. The rest of us are in 150 offices throughout the world. We have a breakdown of um, trying to balance always in terms of gender and nationalities, 50% from the South and 50% male, female, and you can see that ratio is pretty, pretty close to that target. I think this is important to the required profiles, and I should begin by explaining what I do, because normally uh, when I explain people what I do, um, they, they don't necessarily understand. And the reason is because my title is representative. So it sounds like the perfect diplomatic title. And that's the least of the things that I do. Representative means that I'm the representative of the organization to the government of the country where I'm uh, stationed. But m primarily, my role is to have responsibility for the negotiation of, for the implementation of, and for the delivering the results on a country program, which is basically a program that we negotiate with Brazil, with Argentina, for Paraguay. So therefore, it's a, it's a very substantive position. Mind you, it's also a managerial position. And the reason I take the time to mention this, because right now in UNFPA, because of our own demographic, demographic transition, we have a lot of people retiring, and there are opportunities at this level. And uh, UNFPA has, has a deficit of people who in, uh, in addition to the, one of the UN working language, speak Portuguese. So we are particularly keen in this, in this event to try to promote interest from, from people in Brazil because of that lack of, of Portuguese speaking people within the organization. So what kind of profiles? Population and development and uh, demography. And uh, um, Brazil is one of the, the countries where this, 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 this areas are in, in, in better and, and more uh, supply. So we are in, in keen to look for people in these areas. Reproductive and public health, and I see my, my, my counterpart in the audience, this is an important area, people with medical backgrounds, with, with uh, public health back, backgrounds, uh, maternal health, mid, mid, midwife, midwifery uh, also, health economics, uh, gender, and, and gender-based violence, HIV AIDS, also people with programming uh, backgrounds, people who have worked with development cooperation programs, managing, developing, and um, formulating those programs for evaluation, what's in m and &E, and uh, reproductive health commodity securities. I, I should explain what this means. It's really managing supply chains in terms of reproductive health commodities. Everything that has to do, go from, from contraceptives to, 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 to condoms and also uh, uh, inputs to maternal health, supply chains, which basically ensuring that the countries, every country in the world is able to meet the demand for this, for these, for these, uh, for these um, uh, commodities. So this is a particular area where UNFPA requires a profile that uh, um, normally we, we are not looking for. Um, uh, these are the entry level of, uh, uh, areas, I believe, for, for, for this audience in particular. It's about the current vacancies and the vacancies that will be there throughout the next few years. As I said, we are, we are, we, we are looking at an intense period of attrition in the organization where people are going to retire. So in the next few years, it's important to follow those current vacancies. Service contract is much more a modality where we engage uh, consultants. And I believe my colleagues will go deeply into the other modalities. Thank you very much. How ironic. Here I am going to speak about the young professionals. How many people here are 32 or younger? So I know how much time to spend. Oh, my God. They're all so young. All right. My name is Lynn Goldberg. I'm not going to go into my long history of career. I'm actually going to tailor this for the mid-careers. Most of us, I just found out in the last uh, session, started when we were 30 or. Uh, so mid-career means uh, having at least five or more years experience is a good thing. I started my professional career with the UN in peacekeeping operations. I'm a lawyer by training. I started uh, my first mission in 1993 as a human rights lawyer in Haiti. Once you get in, uh, it's a lot easier to get your next job. 
Specifically, if you want to work internationally, you really need to prove your credibility. So even though I'm from New York, I did not get my first job in New York. After uh, Haiti, I worked as an electoral officer in um, South Africa during the elections in 1994. And from there, I took a risk and I went to Rwanda in the very, very early days uh, in the aftermath of the genocide, again, as a human rights lawyer. Surprise, surprise, I met my first husband there. I mean, so you just never know, is my point, what's going to happen. I was focused on getting professional experience. After Rwanda, I left the UN, and this is also important for the mid-careers, because uh, you can come in, you can leave, and you can come back. I worked as a prosecutor of child abuse for New York City, then I got a master's in public administration, came back to the headquarters, worked in legal affairs, and this is important for you, okay? So I'm a lawyer, I did human rights, then I was a lawyer, I did treaty law, then I worked in the Department of Peacekeeping, doing administrative law, then I left law and worked as the special assistant to the head of logistics, doing more policy-related work, and somehow ended up in the Office of Human Resources doing staff relations issues, and then came to my current job doing outreach. So there's a pattern in the type of skills, but not necessarily the jobs. And I think this is what, as mid-careers, you need to keep in mind when you're applying, how you can sell your skill sets and how they're transferable for different jobs. Now, getting to the 32-year-olds and younger. Every year, we offer uh, the Young Professionals Program, and we invite member states whose nationals are not adequately represented among our staff. So this year, Brazil is a participating country. As the program suggests, it's for young professionals, so you need to be 32 or younger. It is an entry-level uh, way to come into the UN with little or no professional experience. And it's pretty much the only way to come into the Secretariat with less than five years of experience. This year, we're giving the exam December 3rd. Uh, we're giving it in five areas. Let's see if I can get them right. Um, it's cocktail time for me. Uh, administration, finance, Statistics, don't tell me, statistics, law, and what's the last one? Public information. So do we have any people 32 younger in those areas? Great. You need to have at least a first level degree in one of those areas, but if you have a master's or some professional experience, that's even better. Because in the first round, we only take 40 people per area per country. So Brazil, the total amount of people taking the YPP, the maximum this year is 40 times 5, 200. I can still do some math. So the point is, in the initial phases, you're competing with the best in your own country then you are convoked for the exam. It costs no money to apply. Um, and you can take the exam in Brasilia, or if you're not in Brazil when we offer the exam on December 3rd, you can take it in almost any place we have an exam center. Uh, the application period begins June 3rd. We suggest you apply early because if there are technical problems, if there is any other kind of issues, we're not accepting any late applications and we're not extending the deadlines. So there's 60 days that you have to apply. We're doing it staggered this year 
So certain groups will apply uh, June 3rd, and the second group will apply when? August, the second round. Um, now I'm going to talk about something you're probably all very interested in. Uh, well, LEAD also. The UNDP also has a professional program geared more to mid-careers. These are people with some experience. You have to have a master's degree. You have to speak uh, uh, two of the UN official languages, so English and Spanish or French and um, Russian. Um, their program right now is suspended. They're, and the reason for that is they're revamping it and reorganizing it. But we raise it just so you know that there are some organizations, the World Bank also, that has young professionals programs. So these are for people um, who are not yet ready with the five years but want to come in um, that way. Now for the favorite part, the pay and the benefits. I mean, I think if you talk to any one of us, uh, we work for the UN because we believe in the values. You're not going to see me in Afghanistan or Rwanda without water and electricity just because of a paycheck, right? There are easier ways to make the money. But I really, and I think I speak for my colleagues when I say I feel that I, this is all I could do. I couldn't work as a lawyer in the private sector. So for me, it wasn't that difficult a choice. But we do get compensated very well. Uh, we have competitive salaries. We have uh, excellent pension. My second husband couldn't even believe the pension we had. He's like, no, you have it wrong. No, I didn't have it wrong. And he's gone. So the point, because I have a good pension, I didn't need him. So the point is, I told you, it's cocktail hour. Um, we also have excellent medical, excellent uh, vacation. And because most of you are not going to be working in Brazil if you come work with us, we have really good packages. So if we hire you to come work with us in Addis Ababa, we will pay to move you, the family, the furniture, the pets, to Addis Ababa. We will also give you certain living allowances. We will also pay for you and the family, probably not the pets, to go back home once every two years. You can go more, but we're going to pay once for the family to go. Um, we have excellent training programs. You can learn languages, any of the six official languages on UN time and get certain extra financial incentives for that, as well as we have e-learning. So all of that we have. Now, if we hire you to come work in Mali, which as Susan said is the latest startup mission, which is probably um, where they're recruiting mostly right now, we're not going to pay for the family to go because you don't want the family there. Uh, it's not the safest environment for the dog. So what you want is other compensation because we understand it's a hardship uh, situation. So we're going to give you hardship allowance, also hazard pay because there are hazards. Uh, we will also give you additional rest and recuperation, double what I get staying in New York, you will get a month. So if I get two and a half days in New York annual leave, you get five in Mali, Afghanistan, um, places where there's hardship. Because, and you're forced actually to take a break every two months, which so you can add up your vacation time. And I have friends in Haiti every two months. She's in New York for two weeks. So it works out. Um, we also pay for you to visit your family once a year. Of course, you can visit them more unless you have my family. So it's less, but it depends, you know. So the point is you wouldn't not come to us because you were worried about the conditions. And as Marta said in the beginning, or conditions of service and, you know, we can't say what a starting salary 
is, well, we all have same starting salary, but depending on your duty station, there's different entitlements. You can Google it and get some kind of idea or go to the International uh, Civil Service Commission and get it, and there's a calculator on the UN Secretariat. But trust me, um, if you have a family, it's, it's not, the, you shouldn't worry about the compensation. It's pretty competitive. Consultants and contractors. All of us have uh, consultancies and contractors. The UN, um, do we have that slide with the, no, we don't have that slide. Okay, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, the UN also has uh, institutional contractors. Now, we don't hire them as staff, but it, they go through a procurement process. So if any of you have small businesses and you want to be competitive, you would go to the procurement uh, email site and register your business, which uh, then you can bid and you'll get the RFPs. As for consultancies, um, some organizations offer more than others. For example, UNDP, Mari said, have tons of consultancies. So part of uh, being in the game is knowing which organizations you're looking at for which things. I mean, the UN is starting the Secretariat to advertise its consultancies, but frankly, we don't offer as many as UNDP, UNICEF, the other organizations. We have some. And on that note, I don't know what the next slide is. The internship program. Most of you, I think, are beyond that age, but if you or you know people who are in graduate programs, we offer internships, our organizations, at any family duty station. So there's tons of international organizations, UN in Brazil, where they might be interested, also worldwide in Addis Ababa, Santiago. The internships are unpaid. That's the bad news. The experience you get, uh, I speak for myself, is invaluable. But what I would suggest, if you know someone who wants to do an internship and they can't afford to do it unpaid, to do it anywhere locally, at any organization, charity, something to get the experience. Uh, I think in Brasilia, you're lucky because there are a lot of those international entities around. But if you want to go with us, the minimum is two months. As I said, the only requirement is enrollment in graduate. Uh, program and we give you a certificate at the end. Now I'm turning it over to Marta for UNV. Okay, so before we finish this section, uh, we want to speak to you about the United Nations Volunteer. This is a program that serves the whole UN system. So UNV is based in uh, Bonn and uh, they are administered by UNDP. So they provide volunteers for the UN Secretariat. For example, we normally have around 3,500 per year. UNDP, more than 2,000 per year, et cetera, et cetera. So they provide volunteers to all uh, the UN system organizations. And as it uh, names indicate, is volunteers that are serving for us. There are three main types of volunteers. Uh, the international, uh, volunteers that I'll speak to you in a minute. We have the online volunteers and then we have the global youth program that will be launched uh, very soon. So international volunteers. These are individuals that are mostly serving in field locations, Liberia, Afghanistan, Sudan. And normally the minimum requirement is that you have a university degree that you have 25 years of age, and that you speak one of the language of the UN system. For the international volunteers, the two years and the 25 is the absolute minimum. We have very young professionals serving as UN volunteers, but we also have many individuals that have it as a second career. They joined at the 50s, at the 60s. So it doesn't matter the age, but what is most important is that is the absolute minimum. While it is a volunteer assignment, uh, we do pay for your uh, travel uh, cost uh, from, let's say, Brazil 
to Liberia, let's say the UNP is in Brazil and back, we do pay for settlement cost and uh, we do pay for a certain living allowance. The compensation is not the same, but it is a very good opportunity to join the UN. Uh, for example, the HR director currently in UNFPA, he started as a UN volunteer in the field. So it's a way of also joining the UN. The fields that they are looking for is the same fields as all of us. At this point in time, they're concentrating a bit more on the health field as well as the logistic field. So uh, the online volunteers, many of you may not be able at this point in time to apply for a position or to go outside the country, but you wish to contribute in a certain way. So we also have online assignments. These are not paid. These are really truly volunteer assignments, but they're assignments that you can do at home, you can do in any location. Just if you have a computer, you can work and, and uh, deliver a result. For example, last year there were more than 10,000 online assignments that were done and at the end, the individual receives a certificate for the contribution that he or she has made. And then finally, the youth program. One of ILO's uh, main um, areas of intervention, particularly since last year, is the youth and the concern that in the UN system, but many countries have on the employment of youth in the future and, and the increase of that range of age. So the Secretary General has been very vocal about it, and UNV will be launching later this year a youth program for individuals that are between 18 and 29 years of age, with no experience or minimum experience, or without any degree, or with some degree, depending on the assignment. They will have a compensation package, not as same as international volunteers, but it is a way of trying to support that young, talent that is coming worldwide and that may will have more difficulties in the future. So on that note, we are practically finalizing uh, the first session. I do want to stress a, a few things. We all look for your skills, for your technical skills. If you are engineers, what is your knowledge of engineer? If you are lawyers, your substantive skills in, in, um, in the legal field. But equally important for us, we look for other areas. For example, are you creative? Can you plan and organize? Can you be adaptable? Can you be flexible? So during the assessment, we will be looking for those things. At this point in time, I'm going to hand it over to Susan in one minute before I ask two questions. And that is how to apply to the UN system. And she will be giving you some tips. But before considering applying, who is married here? Who has a partner? Who has a boyfriend? Who has a girlfriend? Who has children here? Okay. We all urge you to, dis before applying, discuss it with them. It's not an individual decision. The UN may be for you, it may not be for you. All of us, we recommend it. For example, Harold has his family and the children and he can give you all the challenges. It's a wonderful life, but you will be away from your family. You will be away from your food, from your culture, from your music. And obviously you will have the UN family with you, but you know yourselves. And so therefore you need to reflect it but you also need to reflect it with your family. So we encourage you to discuss it with them before you even start exploring. So we don't want to discourage you, but we want to be honest with you. Now I go to those that did not raise the hand. Who does not have a partner? Who does not have a boyfriend? Who does not have a girlfriend? Who does not have a husband? Who does not have a wife? Who does not have children? Oh, we have quite a few of you. So you think you were relieved? You also have to reflect. Why? Because it's very likely that your partner, your boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, uh, uh, wife, 
may not be from Brazil. There's someone here that said, mm, okay. So, but you know yourselves. You need, to, you need to reflect on that. So it is a wonderful life, as we all t uh, tell you, but it has its challenges also. So you need to reflect on that. And we have sometimes people in the audience that clearly indicate, now, to be frank, I will not be able to handle it. So you also need to reflect on it. Is it clear? So both groups have some reflection to do. And now I'm going to hand it to Susan. She loves telling you and giving you tips on how to apply because she's one, uh, as, mon, as, all, as many of us, that has to review at those applications. So she will tell you and give you some tips on what she looks for when she receives them. Thank you, Marta. I think, Marta, you made a very important point um, about self-reflection. Even if you're a single person and you don't have kids and a husband or even a boyfriend, at the point of application to the UN, I remember when I was uh, sat in London about seven and a half, almost eight years ago, and um, I'd applied for a, for a job that I found on the website of the United Nations Development Program where Mary currently works. And um, I was a little surprised that I'd been offered an interview because I'd never uh, worked for the UN before. I did have international development experience. I, I met the um, criteria of the job description that I was applying to, but you know, I, I never seriously thought that they would step forward and offer me an interview. And of course, I was interested, and of course, I was going to do the interview, no question about it. But I, I did have that moment of self-reflection, because although I have a sister, she also lives overseas, and my parents are getting older. so. That was my concern about moving to the other side of the world and, and leaving aging parents. So, you know, she makes a very valid point. Even if you're not married and you don't have kids, there is always going to be some kind of impact in your life that you just have to step back and, and take a moment to think about. Um, but it's a wonderful organization to work for. It's, it's, it's truly a wonderful experience to be part of the UN family. So now I'm going to give you what I feel is the most valuable information that we can give you today. Um, when I was uh, in London, though, seven and a half years ago, I was very fortunate that I knew somebody um, who was working at the UN, and they gave me some of the tips that you'll see today. And I took those tips very seriously, and I did my homework. I used Google, and, um, and I, I looked at the posts that other people had placed on the internet about the best way to approach an interview with the UN. So I did my homework, um, and I think it paid off because I was offered the job. So some of the tips that I received, you're going to see in these slides, and we're actually going to give you much more information than I received all those years ago. And I don't want you to worry. Um, you don't need to make any notes, um, because this presentation is going to be online for you through the, the ministry website a little later on. And also bear in mind that if you're not the one interested in working with us, it may be that your brother or your sister is or your friend. So please, anybody else who you know that may be interested in applying, please direct them to this information because it really, really is valuable. So the application process, it's a little complex. It takes some time and there's various stages, just like any other organization or private sector company in the world. Um, you have to search for the job openings, and I suggest that you search for job openings that fit the skills and the relevant experience that you have. You know, I'm a human resources person, so I'm never going to be searching for a job in political affairs or human rights, but I could be searching for a job, say, in administration or finance and budget. Um, you need to understand the position itself, so that means reading the job description very, very carefully multiple times. And you need to also understand the location of the job. So if you're not willing to move to Geneva, or if you're not willing to move to Addis Ababa, please don't apply. You must be motivated to go to the location of where the job's based. The next step would be to create your online profile. And we use a form called a personal history profile, or a PHP. That's the standard form that we use in the secretariat uh, when you're making your job applications. In the agencies, funds, and programs, where Harold and Mary work, they have a very similar form called a P11. There is a slight difference, but it's a very, very similar form. 
And the form is quite long and extensive, um, but once you've built it into our system, the applications that you make after that initial one will be much quicker and much simpler. So you can find for the Secretariat, the United Nations Secretariat, which is where myself, Lynn, and Marta work, um, on our careers website, careers.un.org. Um, you can sign up to receive job alerts to the different areas that you, you feel as though you're interested in and you have the experience for. Um, or you can just go on there periodically and search yourselves without receiving the job alerts. And just as a little point of information, um, different parts of the organization, such as UNFPA, where Harold works, and UNDP, where Mari work, they have their own careers website. So you also have to check the agencies, funds, and programs, individual websites as well. Um, and we, we've provided you with a list of all of the different agencies, funds, and programs. This is the one for the United Nations Development Program. This is UNFPAs. And this is UNVs. So there's some things to keep in mind just as you're approaching making your application. As I say, I can't stress enough, please understand the position that you're applying to, and please uh, be sure that you want to serve in the location of where the position is. We receive thousands of applications sometimes, so we want very serious candidates who are willing to move. You log into our system, you create a, a little account, and you log into our system, and you start building your profile. Our system's called Inspira, and you have to go through many stages of building your profile. You have to fill in information about your educational details, any publications that you may have written, all of your job history. So, you know, the group that we were talking to before you, they, they were a little younger, so maybe, you know, they don't have as much experience to fill in. Mid to senior level positions, please be quite comprehensive with your experience. Um, and I also can't stress enough for mid to senior level candidates, please write about your, your leadership and your management experience, especially if you're going to work in the field missions, because in the field missions, they, they tend to, um, how can I say it, give leadership and management opportunities at a little bit of a lower level than maybe what you'll find at headquarters. So if we can see that you're applying to a mid-level position and you have very strong leadership and management skills and you're interested in going to the field, it could be that we could be very interested in your application. Um, so in addition uh, to your employment history and your education and your publications, um, please tell us about which languages that you speak. Please be very careful when you're filling in this section um, because we want to know if you speak any of the six official languages, but we want to know what your mother tongue is. Um, you know, we're asking whether you speak any other languages like English, French, Russian, Arabic, Chinese, Spanish, um, but we also want to know what your mother tongue is. And it may not be the, the language that you work in on a day-to-day -day basis. So please just have a little eye for detail when you're filling in this section. And also we want you to provide some references um, if you can provide up-to-date references, that would be fantastic. Somebody who knows you right now, who knows your performance, who knows your work ethic, who knows the quality of your work. Maybe not somebody from 10 years ago. We want to, we want to talk to somebody who knows you right now. Um, so the employment history section is probably the most comprehensive and the longest part to fill out. Um, you need to tell us about the duties that you are performing right now in, in your current job or in previous jobs gone by. Um, so we want to know essentially what did you do in your job? What was your day-to-day -day role? What was, your, what was your role as part of the team that you were working in? Um, we want you to describe your responsibilities with very careful attention to the vacancy that you're applying to. So tell us about your responsibilities, keeping in mind that job description that I told you to read and reread because we want to tailor, we want you to tailor the experience and the duties that you're telling us about to what we're asking for in the job description. If you don't tailor it, then all you're doing is diluting your application. You're not making it as strong as it could be. So please only stick to what we're asking for in the job description, and please tell us about those skills that you have. 
for the current job that you're working in right now, we want you to use the present tense. And for jobs in years gone by, we want you to use the past tense. Um, you wouldn't believe how many people can't follow this simple instruction. And it matters because, you know, when we're looking at your job application, we're also looking at your drafting skills. We want to see how well that you write. And uh, this is something that we also take into consideration when we're looking at your application. The next part of the application form is the one that I find the most challenging. It's called the summary of achievements. So we want to know in your day-to-day -day duties what it was that you actually achieved. What do you achieve on a day-to-day -day basis? Or what is it that you've been working on for the past three, four, five months? What has it accumulated in achieving? You know, so maybe uh, you're working in finance and budgeting and you've been spending, you've been working as a team for four months in preparing your annual budget or your auditing report, and it's resulted in you preparing a budget of $50 million on time, submitted on time, uh, or maybe you're answering questions for an auditing exercise that your company's going through. Uh, maybe you've provided answers and feedback to the questions of the auditors on time to the satisfaction of the auditors, um, which has resulted in your management being happy with you and your, your department's objectives being achieved. Everybody kind of overlooks this part, I always feel. They don't give it enough importance. And again, it's a very important and useful tool in many ways. It summarizes you as a person and what you can offer the organization. But it also allows us, once again, to look at your drafting skills. So the cover note is, is I feel, overlooked a lot of the time by applicants, but as a recruiter, it's one of the key things that I look at because I can get a quick snapshot of you in about 15, 20 seconds. Um, so I, I suggest or we suggest that you use the cover letter to describe how your experience, qualifications and competencies um, are a good fit for the position that you're applying to. And just as a little tip, and this was one of the tips that I received seven years ago, look at the job description about halfway down, we talk about competencies. So competencies could be planning and organizing, teamwork, communication, leadership. Whatever competencies you see listed in that job description, they are the only ones that we'll be testing you on in the interview. So if it's not listed there, we won't be testing you on it in the interview. So that gives you an advantage already. You know what to expect when it comes to us testing you in the interview. If, it's, if, we list competent, uh, if we list communication and planning and organizing or judgment and decision making, you can guarantee we're going to ask you about those things. So don't worry about leadership or teamwork if it's not listed. Some more additional tips. Can we just go back? Because I always think tips are very, very useful. Um, please be truthful. Uh, we do receive applications that are not always truthful, and we find out. Um, maybe sooner, maybe later, but we find out. And we're looking for people with integrity as well. Um, please make your words count. Um, you know, again, as a recruiter, we're looking at your skills and your experience, but we're also looking at your drafting abilities as well. And if you can't spell check and you can't... Uh, uh, put commas in the right places, we can see this and it matters because we want people who can draft very well. Um, so please proofread or please use uh, Microsoft Word to prepare your application and then just cut and paste it in. Um, print your application because if we do call you for an interview, you need it in front of you to reference from. And please save your applications because you never know when you can use them again in the future. You know, you may be applying for a, a political affairs position today or a human rights position today, or a logistics officer today. And you may not have, you know, two years may have gone past, then all of a sudden you see another position for political affairs or logistics. At least you have that application saved, and all you need to do is quickly update it. So it saves you a lot of time, and it's very efficient. Um, so on that note, thank you very much. I hope you find those tips useful. They will be on the ministry website. Please pass them to your friends and anyone else who could be interested. And now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about interviewing. Okay, let's pretend 
you fully obeyed Susan and you did a very good application and we call you for an interview. We sometimes receive 2,000 applications, 3,000 applications. And after sometimes an assessment, we call you for the interview. For the interview, it's normally five, maximum 10 people. So you do have a good chance of making it. So what we want is to give you some tips on how to prepare for the interview. Many candidates arrive to the interview unprepared. And if it's only five candidates, you have 20% of the chances to be able to make it. So give it a good try. It's a good investment. And it may be not for that position. Sometimes we interview, you may not be the best fit, but we may remember you for another position. So remember, it is important for you to try to make the best out of the interview. With us and with the outside world, it's exactly the same. The ones who arrive for the interview are very, very few. In the UN uh, system, as I said before, we look for your professional skills. But we also look to see how you behave, how you work in a team. What's your name? Fernanda. Fernanda. Yes? Good. So during the interview, I would like to know as much as I can about Fernanda. What is your profession? She's a program analyst. So I would like to know about her as a program analyst. But if I'm hiring her, let's say for that field, I may want to know, is she creative? Can she plan and organize? So I would like to, for, I would like to know more about Fernanda during the interview. So during the interview, we will be asking you for examples of your professional life. For those that will be applying for the YPP, it can be from your uh, years uh, at the university. And we will be looking for you to give us an example where you can prove to us that you're creative, where you can prove to us that you can plan and organize, where you can indicate to us and present to us how you can work in a team. Is it clear? Yes? So we'll expand a bit more. So the core competencies that most of our organizations have are very similar. The creativity, planning and organizing, client orientation, um, uh, teamwork spirit, etc. In our job openings, we have the education requirement. Years of experience, five, seven, 12 but we also indicate there the competencies. So if the vacancy announcement says that one competency is, for example, communications, you will have a question on communications. If the job opening does not have communications or does not have planning and organizing, you will not have a question on planning and organizing. When preparing for an interview, reflect on your working experience, reflect on your years at university, and have a two or three examples. Two or three examples for you to demonstrate that you can plan and organize, that you can work in a team. Is it clear? Yes? All right. So during the interview, we will use the CAR principle. The CAR principle is that we would like you to give us an example where you had a specific situation. Let's say I'm going to take um, our dear friend Isabel here from the ministry. She had to plan and organize this event. So the competency is planning and organizing. So we will ask her, can you give us a, an example where you had to plan and organize an event? That's the context. What was your role, Isabel's role. What were the different actions she had to take? What were, for example, the results? What were the challenges? If you had difficulties, we like to know how you handle the difficulties. And normally we do ask you, 
What did you learn? All of us learn with every single uh, task that we do. We are learning here and you are learning from us. So we do want to see how you reflect and how you learn. Is it clear? Yes? All right. So if we call you for an interview, go through the vacancy announcement, reflect on your life, and choose two or three examples for each competency. If it's a face-to-face -face interview, practice before a, a mirror, practice with your friends, with your family. If it's a telephone interview, and here it comes, we do not have the budget to fly every one of you for an interview. So therefore, many of our interviews are on the phone or via Skype or via VTC. So if it's a telephone interview, also practice. So who likes telephone interviews? <laughs> Mary, normal, right? OK. Advantages of a telephone interview. Come on. I know it's late. Advantages. Come on. There are advantages and disadvantages in both. Advantage of a telephone interview. You don't need to dress up. Oh, you don't need to dress up. That's true. You can wear whatever you want. You can even be in a smoking. OK, another advantage of a telephone interview. You can check your notes. Mm, very interesting. Yes, you can have your notes, and you can have them in front of you to remind you. But please do not read. Your intonation is different when you read than when you're thinking. And we notice it. So we will follow up. So have them there to remind you of some things. No problem. But do not read. Clear? Another advantage of a telephone interview. You can have the job description of you to remind you, but you can also have it in the face-to-face. -face. You can have it over there. Hmm? Any other advantage? You choose the place. It's a place you know. You just need to tell, give us a telephone line. Face to face, we choose the place. You do not know the place. Is it clear? All right, so for the telephone interview, or for any interview, we do urge you to speak and to let us know about you. So I had Fernanda, what's your name? Luis, are you a friend? Are you friends, and what is your name? Fabiano, okay. So let's say I call for an interview for Luis. I want to know as much as possible about Luis, right? I don't want to know about Fabiano. Fabiano, I know, is very important for you. But during the interview, I'm not interested in Fabiano. I'm interested in Luis. Do you work together? OK, all right. So during the interview, very often, we get the answer, we did this. We did this. We did this. I'm not hiring both of you. I'm interested in you. Is it clear? All right. I want to know about you. So let's say we do teamwork. And you start. And you say, we did this. You can start like that. But you have to continue. This was my role. This is why, what I did. This is what I contributed. Is it clear? You have 45 minutes. And what we want to know is as much as possible is about you and see how you can contribute to the team. And be as genuine as possible. It can be very simple examples. But just indicate and give us a gist of what, how you behave. Is it clear? If you say we, doesn't matter, but please don't overdo it. What we want to know is about you. Is it clear? We are not hiring the whole group. We are not hiring the whole family. It's just about me. Clear? All right. Uh, don't do blanket statements. Go to the point, and that is why you need to practice. And please don't memorize what is in the managerial books or any book. What we want to know is what you know and how you behave. 
in the telephone uh, interview, particularly if you do not understand the question at the end, ask us and we will repeat it. No negative points. We want to make sure that you understand the question. Hmm? Yes. Telephone interview, please do not lie on the floor. Try to be sitting down. Don't put your hand like that, even on a VTC. You would be amazed what we have to go through. Some of you get very nervous, right? Who choose chewing gum here? Chewing gum? No chewing gum? You chew, chew chewing gum? You like chewing gum? No, not now, but do you? Okay, interview, no chewing gum. You chew it before the interview and after the interview. Is it clear? Particularly in the phone interview. You lose first concentration, and then on the line we will notice it. You can have your water. Just because we are not seeing you, no eating, no chips, no popcorn. You will be amazed sometimes what we have to, to go through through, this, uh, through the interviews. Is it clear? It's just 45 minutes of your life. And then um, I think I'll end it here. Now, now comes the very fun part the part that I really like. I need two, two volunteers. Wait, wait, I don't want all the hands up. I want a lady and I want a gentleman. So I want of the ladies, who wants to be a volunteer? Stand up, I, I need brave people in the UN. So I have one volunteer here. Any other lady wants to be a volunteer? Come on. Two, wonderful. Anyone else wants to be a volunteer? Three, wonderful. Okay, Isabel, do you know any one of them? You don't think so? Come. Okay, so here. Okay. So, why did you, vo why did you offer to volunteer? Since you asked for a volunteer, I decided to volunteer. It, but you asked for a man and a woman. Okay, so you have full trust in me. Good. <laughs> Why did you volunteer? This is a great opportunity to make a test. <laughs> okay, and then who was the other one over there? Do you have a microphone there? No. Why did you volunteer? Because of the opportunity also. Maybe very good. Okay, so Isabel, you listen to the three of them. Unfortunately, like in any selection, we have to choose one. So who do you want to choose? I'll choose the bravest, the first one. The, okay, so thank you so much. So come, 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 come to stage. You, this is her <laughs> smile. She really trusts me. <laughs> okay, now I need a gentleman. Stand up. Good, brave. Here. Stand up. Stand up. Any other men? No? Oh, this is really gender parity. Three men, three women. Excellent, 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 excellent. Okay, what am I going to ask you? Okay, what is your favorite color? Green, your favorite color. Blue. Which one? Orange. You come to screen because her first one was blue and second gray. So thank you so much to the other two. Are you sure? 
Okay, good. All right. Can you, uh, while, oh no, the team has already done everything. All right, this is excellent. Okay, so can you give us your name and what do you do? My name is Flavia Ribeiro. I work as international relations uh, with international cooperation at the Ministry of Health, but I'm an external consultant from PAHO. Mm, wonderful. And what do you do? Uh, I'm a law clerk at the Supreme Court. I mm. work with one of the judges. Oh, that's very interesting. And your name? Carlos. Carlos. Yes. Good. Okay, applause for them. Okay. They are brave. They are here trusting us and me without knowing what we are going to do. But they are here to help themselves and help you. Is it clear? I don't know if you know them, but if we go out the streets, Mission Impossible, remember, you get instructions, they are destroyed, you forget them. So if you meet Carlos in the street and you bump into him, please don't say, oh, you were the one who did this. No, 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 no. Okay? Is that not okay? Yeah. You're very nervous? Okay, so you have seen them, so can you come? One here. Carlos, Carlos, come, 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 come. Here, here. So who wants to go? I love when I ask this question. Okay. The, the gentleman always says, ladies first. <laughs> They're so nervous. They're so nervous. <laughs> Okay, so I ask the lady then, do you want to be first? Okay, all right, so the lady is going to go first. So what we are going to do is we're going to ask, we're going to do a simulation of a telephone interview. Each one of them is going to be asked uh, one question from one of us and we'll share it. And then you will be the interview panel with us, right? So listen, it will help you to prepare for an interview. Is that okay? So, who is going to be the interviewer? You? Len. Okay. Claudia? M May I say? Is this Flavia? Yes, it is me. And it is me, Lynn. It's Flavia. It's Flavia speaking. Suavia. Flavia. Flavia. F L A V I A. Yes, I see it before me. Thank you. Um, this is Lynn Goldberg. I'm calling from the United Nations for your scheduled interview. Are you prepared? Yes, Lynn. Uh, pleased to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce you to the rest of the panel. We have Harold Robinson, who is joining us from Brasilia. And then we have Marta Helena Lopez, who is the hiring manager with me from New York. Okay? Okay. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Now, as you know, uh, this is a competency-based interview, and we will all be asking you one of the competencies listed in the job opening. So I'm going to start with the first competency of teamwork. Could you please tell us a time when you were a member of an unsuccessful team? not successful. And please tell us, what was the situation? What was your role? 
what do you think made the team unsuccessful? And how did you handle any of the disagreements or challenges? What were the results? And what, if anything, did you learn from the experience? Or would you do differently? Yes. Mm. Do you need me to repeat the question? <laughs> no, no. Just one minute to remember the situation. But yes, I, I, I understand the question very well. Thank you. OK. Um, well, um, We, we did uh, a meeting uh, in the beginning of this year. We had this, uh, we uh, are starting a, an alliance uh, with the Gates Foundation, uh, which is an alliance in health research. This is uh, our first initiative, which is a, a RFP in pretend birth. And we were supposed to, we were supposed to organize this meeting here in Brasilia, but uh, people were, uh, were they were late. They there there um, was, was a two-day meeting and was supposed to start in, in the beginning of the morning, about nine o'clock. They were supposed to uh, arrive at the airport around six thirty in the morning and go straight to the place uh, with the meetings the way the meeting what what happened and um we had to we had the whole schedule and our secretariat he was supposed to start the meeting to open the meeting and only has the his agenda for the morning time and i was organized i i, I was i was organizing with a friend and uh, she was responsible to check the the, the schedule uh, of the the, 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 the the people that was were coming from the United States and I was uh, with the schedule from our our personal staff our secretary and our directors uh, the our keynote speeches speakers um, well uh, the, the they were they left their their their, their flight in Sao Paulo and they were supposed to arrive here around uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. But we had to reorganize the whole schedule to have the, our authority presence in the meeting. And, um, and Flavia, just let me stop you here. Can you just move to like your specific role in the team and how you dealt with the problems, not so much everybody else? Okay. <laughs> yes, sure. Um, I I pretty much uh, I get in contact with the the local office, the the United States office, to help them with the the flight schedule open in front of me to find the best way uh, a early flight so we could have them early and not uh, postpone the meeting like half a day. And then we figure out a solution, and we were able to, to call them in Sao Paulo. And we fortunately brought them uh, only two hours late. And we could uh, redo, rebuild the schedule uh, without missing half a day and our authority presence. But I, I was the one who uh, figured out this schedule problem and that I found the, the, the flight, I have this, I, I, I have this initiative to, to find the, the, another flight, to call them and to ask them to go to their, uh, the, 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 the place. The, the You're the, hired. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Were you nervous? Yes, a little. A little, yes. Her voice, did you notice that she was nervous? Yes, a little bit. Did you notice that her different intonation of voices when she was moving her hands? So whenever you move your hand, you do any movement, your voice is affected. All right, so the question was regarding teamwork. Did Flavia 
choose a good example to demonstrate to the panel that she can work in a team. Or was the example better for another competency? Hmm? Proactivity, yes. But what other example could it have been? Yes, creativity. Okay. This is important. When you are reflecting on your work experience, you have to be very careful on your examples. Some examples can be used for more than one competency. Planning and organizing, creativity, teamwork. But if the question is regarding teamwork, your angle has to be teamwork. You have to demonstrate with that example that you can work in a team. If the question is regarding planning and organizing, you have to use the planning and organizing angle. At the end of your answer, the team, the interview panel, has to be convinced that you can plan and organize. Creativity, the same. I'll give you an example. Uh, the other day we had creativity and the person was doing very well and suddenly he said, and this idea was of my colleague. Now, we wanted to know whether he could be creative, not the colleague. Is it clear? Yes? So you have to reflect and choose quite a number of examples. Let's say this was an example for creativity and Flavia used it for creativity. Was it clear what was her role? A little bit, but you see, that's why you have to practice. Because when you practice and you reflect, and obviously here we put you off guard, you will reflect and say, okay, the team did this, but these were my responsibilities. This is how we handle it. We do not want you to memorize because we can adapt the questions. Like here, Lynn, she did unsuccessful team. So also look for examples where there were challenges because we can use unsuccessful team or successful team and we can handle the question in different ways. So that is why you need to choose two or three examples. Is it clear? Did she learn from the experience? Didn't come out very clearly, but it was clear that she learned from the experience. The interview panel, do you want to, the, my team, do you want to add anything? Well, I just want to say once I prompted her that she was going on and on about like all the other people, she did pick up very quickly and start focusing. And I don't know if you noticed it, but when she started talking more about herself, I got more interested, right? Because if you're the interview panel, just so you know, we're really much more interested in you than hearing this one's delay. You can set the context very clearly. But we really are interested in you. So even you as the audience, when she talked now, so this is what I did, it becomes more interesting. So just think about that um, from the interview panel. We want her to succeed. If you're called for the interview, you're one of five at the most eight. So you really, really have a good chance. And the panel doesn't want to see you fail. Ah, ha, ha, they don't know the answer. That's not us. Because it's our time. We're investing in this. We want everyone to be good so we have the candidates. So all you need to do is really practice and prepare. When you arrive to the interview, uh, the whole process of, is an expensive process. So therefore, we want us to find the best candidate for the job. But equally, a selection decision is an expensive decision. When I was hired nearly 30 years ago, they really hired me for all these years, and member states have been paying my salary. So it is an expensive decision. So what we want is really to find the right fit for that job 
and potentially to do a career within the UN system. So therefore, that is what we are looking for. Is it clear? All right, so thank you very much, Flavia, but please stay there. You have to give moral support to Carlos, who was such a gentleman in giving you the honors of going first. Right, Carlos? Okay, so are you ready? Yes. Who is going to do the second one? Harold. Okay, so that is the question. Uh -huh. Ring, 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 ring. Hello. Um, hello, good afternoon. Is this Mr. Carlos? Yes, it is. Uh, Mr. Carlos, this is Harold Robinson from the UN. I'm calling for your scheduled interview. Oh, great. How are you? I am doing great, thank you. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, I, I have with, with me Ms. Mar Marta Elena Lopez. Huh? Uh -huh. And also I have um, Lynn Goldberg with me in this interview. So we are going to conduct a panel interview. Great. Okay. Uh, without uh, much ado, let me go ahead. We're going to ask you a question. I would like you to, to uh, be as clear as possible. Um, can you uh, please share with us uh, an example, situation where um, um, a number of demands had been made on you and uh, at the same time you were, you were presented with a fairly complicated set of, of tasks. And can you tell us what was that situation? How, uh, basically, how you handle it. What was the situation? Which was your role? How did you plan and organize the different actions? And what were the results? Uh, it's important also to know what uh, were the takeaways. What did you learn from, from, from the situation? Please, Carlos. Of course. Uh, I do work under a lot of stress and stressful situations. And uh, sometimes there are some kind of actions that the lawyers take during Fridays when we are picking up our coats and leaving home and usually when we are driving home someone calls us back to work and says this decision must be out by midnight so we drive back and we come up to the office and we see everybody going nuts about the the job of reading the the petitions that are sometimes a hundred page long and uh, one of them was a case of a habeas corpus about a meeting that someone would be having at the Congress. And he was wishing to have his constitutional rights preserved and uh, was scared about going to jail if he did not answer any kind of questions from the deputies. So we had to draft that decision in about uh, give or take 30 minutes. So we had to read the paper, describe the situation, give the, ju the judicial fundamentals for the decision, everything in 30 minutes and, public and take that decision to the Congress so that person would not be arrested on site. So when we came back and met with that situation, I had to distribute the competences among my trainees and uh, two judges that were helping. And each had a task. One would make up, would uh, gather up all of the, 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 the precedents of the court regarding that subject. The other would write, the, 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 summarize the situation. And I would, of course, call everybody up in my room, try to pick those puzzle pieces and gather up together in a decision and make it happen through the communications offices in the Supreme Court. So we had a chronometer in our watches and we were like five minutes for every kind of action. And we did it. Uh, the decision came out a little earlier than we thought and it was duly communicated to the Congress before the person even arrived there. Okay, thank you. Carlos, can you tell us what are the main lessons you derived from that particular experience? Well, uh, since it's uh, an experience that uh, took of us 
uh, uh, took off the group a lot of uh, coordination and uh, friendship, uh, to say the least. Something that we already had built up through our weeks and months and years working together. The thing is that that's, if you work with a group that you trust and you trust their competences and you trust them as persons, we can do almost anything with any kind of amount of time. And that's something that I really enjoyed doing. In, in less than 30 minutes, everything was resolved. Okay, Carlos, were you nervous? Uh, uh, no, more or less. More or less. A little bit. Was he nervous? Was his voice clear? Yes? Good. All right. The question was regarding planning and organizing. Are you convinced that Carlos can plan and organize? Plan and organize. Not necessarily. Right? What are you convinced of? Yes. The way he presented the example was more a team that had challenges and had to deliver results. So you see, when you present the example, the same example, if you're using it, you have to use it from a different angle. If it's planning and organizing, we want to know whether you can plan and organize. Like, for example, if we're looking for a logistician that needs to deliver certain uh, uh, products at a certain time, let's say WFP that d distributes it food, and the reason is because I worked in WFP, you used to have to find individuals that could distribute food in very short periods of time, particularly when it's war zone. There is a period of time that there is a ceasefire. So therefore, you do need to distribute that food in that period of time. But also, if you don't distribute it, it's not only that the civilian population doesn't have that food. That food may not be good the next day. So you see, we need to know if you can plan and organize. So in this case, it most better the way you express it was a better, ex a better example for teamwork. Were you clear whether or not Carlos can work, he himself can work in a team, or he can plan and organize? It was more about we, right? It was we did this, and it was very good because it seemed that the team in such a short period of time was able to <coughs> handle a very complex situation. Everyone was concentrated, that's what I got, and everyone was put to the point. We did get some indication of what Carlos did, but it has to become much more evident. Is it clear? Because what we are doing is we want to know about you, not the whole team. Right? This is like in the, do you like soccer? Yes. Okay, so if I'm hiring you to be the goalkeeper, I don't know whether the others can go goalkeep. I want to know about you. Right? Yes? Is it clear? Right? Any other comments from the re rest of the team? Susan, Mary, Harold? All right. So is it clear? Are you going to practice? Of course. For your next interview, even if it's in the outside world? Of course. You will remember all of us, right? your next interview, even if it's in IBM here in Brasilia, you will remember us. You will practice, even if it's just five minutes, yes? Give it a good try. A round of applause for these wonderful volunteers. Thank you so much. All right, just a few more tips for the interview. Uh, do remember, when you express yourself to be gender neutral, be very careful of any comments on the gender, opposite gender. Be very concerned about uh, comments on different nationalities, gender ne uh, nationality neutrality. Have any one of you worked in a political party? No? In a religious organization? No? You can bring those examples. Those are very valid examples. But 
how you express them in the interview have to be neutrality. All right? You have to show the respect of different religions and you have to show the respect of different political beliefs. All of us here, we have our political beliefs, but those are outside the office. At the office uh, scenario, we do need to be uh, gender neutral, nationality neutral, uh, religious neutral, as well as political neutral. Is it clear? Yes? All right, so at this point in time, the whole team is going to come here, and we, we hope that we have a bombardment of questions, of concerns. You can ask whatever you want. It can be of any of the presentations. It can be on the interviews. You can ask us something about our lives. Each one of us have had a different career in the UN system, so therefore we can bring different perspective. If you want one of us specifically to answer a question, just let us know. So let's start with this group. Is there any questions from here? Three, up to three. Any questions from here? Or was it crystal clear? One question at the back. Hello. Uh, my question is about uh, the salary. Uh, most of the openings, uh, the vacancies at the UN web page, uh, it doesn't mention anything about uh, benefits and salary. So sometimes we want to apply for that for that position, but we don't have any information about salary. And sometimes we are, we are already working, so we have to balance and, and check if it's, uh, I mean, if it's uh, good for us or not. Okay. Any other question from this side? Well, uh, good evening. Uh, well, uh, concerning the well, the approach about well, how one should uh, behave during the interview. Uh, what I couldn't notice, I don't know if I got it wrong, but I well, it seemed to me that uh, uh, we should behave in a, or we should talk. Uh, no, in a way that we sh we need to uh, convey uh, a self-centered personality, as in like I did that, I did that, the other thing, and well, uh, I would really like to know if that's really what uh, we should aim for, because well, uh, for what I know here in Brazil. Uh, that's the kind of behavior that's not uh, well. We're not encouraged to follow that kind of behavior or convey that kind of behavior. Uh, so we should uh, uh, convey values of uh, team play and not self-centered ism. I don't know. If okay. I good. Any clear. other question here? One question here. No. Just one second. So my question is, basically I didn't get the part about the translation um, application. We have to speak English and plus two other languages for the UN. That would, would include, it would include Spanish, but not, it was Arabic, Russian. That's my question. I, I didn't get the job okay. thing. All right. All right. Who wants to answer any of the questions? Mary, you want to go? Regarding the, the salary, um, we mentioned that the pay and the benefit package. For every single vacancy, I mean, we have the grade system. So if a position is a P2 level, um, there's always a set, of, set amount for, for the salary depending of your duty station. And then um, depending on your entitlements, whether you're married, whether you have kids that go to school, um, that adds up to your entitlements. So there's a calculator on the, the Secretariat website, I believe, which you can customize according to your, um, your background and then the position. So you can actually check for every single vacancy. Basically, just to complement what Marie says, 
it goes from P2, which is the lowest two years of experience, to D2. For all the salaries, they're published. So you can get an idea. You're not going to get your exact salary because it's going, you'll get the base level of a P4. But if you're a P4 in Geneva, you're going to get more than a P4 in an Addis Ababa because of cost of living additions and, as Marie said, entitlement. So all of this is something that you would also, by the way, never want to ask in an interview because you can Google it. And it's also available publicly on the International Civil Service. And as she said, uh, the Secretariat, we have like a salary calculator where you could get a general idea. If, I believe if the gentleman's question was about the cultural difficulties of centering on your own achievements rather than the group. Um, I can give you a tip. It's the same thing with my culture. It's a very difficult thing to speak about yourself. We, we are in our culture, you don't. But after missing out in a couple of interviews, you, you, be, you start learning. You just have to do it. It's, and I think the process is good in the sense that it forces you to isolate what your contribution was. And I don't think you're being selfish. It's just the fact that as, as, as Marta Elena was saying, you really need to, the panel needs to know what you contributed. I think it's a cultural barrier that we just have to overcome. And the language, uh, and back to the interview, we want you to be genuine. And we do not want you to exaggerate. And we know it is difficult. But as I said, it's an expensive decision. We need to know about you. We don't want to be nosy nosy, but we need to know how you behave in the team. It's good to know a general issue of how you work in a teamwork, but it's more you. Can you be creative? Can you plan and organize? Can you handle a difficult situation? If it's at the managerial level, can you handle a team where we will entrust you with the supervision of staff and with the budget and with a vision of what you need to do? So we need to know that in order to ensure that you're a good match. In the uh, translation field, if you're going to apply for one of the translation exams, you have to have a main language, which has to be one of the official languages, and a thorough good knowledge of two other of the official languages. So that's why you need three. Let's say you choose Spanish as your main language. You have to have either English, French, Arabic, Chinese, or Russian two of those in order to apply. So now let's go to the third, second group here. Who has questions here? So while my friends, three questions, so. Uh, hello, uh, I wanna talk about the YPP. Uh, last year I was invited to take the written exam for social affairs family. And uh, at the end I wasn't invited for the interview. I wasn't. <laughs> oh, you are? No. Oh. <laughs> and uh, my question is around um, uh, uh, maybe transparency of the process because mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure of the criteria you use for correcting the written part of the exam. And I know that um, there are some efforts of the Brazilian government saying that uh, we, uh, Brazil is sub-represented in the UN system, I'm not sure, in the UN secretary. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is correct or not, but what is the criteria you're looking at? Because uh, if Brazil is less represented, I, I maybe somebody was from Brazil, not me, but somebody else was invited, and I, I, I'm not sure if any Brazilian were even okay. invited for the interview. So. Can I? Okay. okay. Go ahead. I, I have two questions, actually. Uh, they're, they're short. I want to know uh, for how long should we apply, for how long before should we apply from when we, are, we have the intention to leave? This is especially for the UNDP and the peacekeeping missions, because I know that for UNPP we have uh, uh, as a specific date on the year that we have to apply, but for other jobs, how long does the process of selecting the candidates usually take? 
And the second doubt, it's about on the application form. Should we mention uh, also um, informal job activities? Because you said this on the young professionals that we should mention everything. But I saw on the application that you don't really have a space for extra, extra working, extra curriculum activities or informal ones. So should we put a volunteer work that we cannot, that we don't have a certificate from UN or something like that? Or it's not so, so relevant for professionals with an experience already? Thanks. Good. And then there's a lady here with the microphone. OK. I have two questions to you. Uh, the first one is quite easy. It's um, how long the UNFPA has been in Brazil? It's because it's um, very new for me. I didn't um, knew about the agency. And also about the overseas vacancies um, in, uh, for open uh, vacancies at other localities overseas. How, how does it work in case I want to apply, for example, uh, for an open uh, vacancy that's open in Africa or in another continent. Okay, so Susan will start with the last one and then we'll go over with the others. Thanks. I, I'll start with your question, um, but I'd also like to combine it with the lady in the back and then my colleagues can, can uh, join in. Um, because the lady in the back asked how far in advance I believe you should apply and then how long does the process take? And you asked about UNDP and, and the field mission. So I'll answer for the field missions and then Mary can answer for UNDP. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, once you're on a roster, you're on there indefinitely for the field operations. So I, we only advertise maybe once or twice a year for 15 to 60 days. So I wouldn't wait. I would take the next opportunity to apply, and I would do this for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you're unsuccessful, you'll have a quicker chance of applying again, rather than if you wait in, in two years' time. If you are successful, that's great, and you're placed onto the roster, you're placed on there indefinitely. So, you know, if we come along and, and give you an offer and say, hey, would you like to go to Sierra Leone or to South Sudan, or to Haiti, and you're not ready yet, that's perfectly acceptable. The point is, you've succeeded in the process, you've placed yourself onto the roster, and you're on there indefinitely. Um, in terms of how long does it take to be selected, that really depends on the mission itself. Um, some missions are very big and robust, and perhaps their recruitment can be a little slower than the smaller, faster missions. It also depends on demand as well. Maybe we're waiting for somebody to retire and the position to open up, or maybe the, the mission's just not ready to fill the vacancy at, you know, at this point in time. So each mission has a different lead-in time. It can be anywhere from two weeks to maybe a year or two. Um, it, it's, that's the reality of it. Um, it really depends on your motivation at the time and the place that you're in at this point in your life, whether you're willing to go and work overseas. But the key to, the, to answering your question is just try and get onto the roster. You know, don't wait. Just take the next opportunity. And if you're not successful, you'll have another chance soon. Um, we've provided the, the ministry with the scheduled list, the tentative list for this year. Uh, broken down by each month, only for the field missions. So you can check with the ministry um, and, and they'll have the list. And your question, I don't know if I've answered your question or... Yeah. Yeah, so as a... Yeah, it's it, it's just as I said to the lady behind you. You just we we advertise for the field missions once or twice every year for 15 to 60 days. So, you know, you could check with the ministry to see if anything that we're anticipating uh, advertising this year suits you and suits your background and your experience. If it doesn't, then you know that you have to wait until next year. Well, I could compliment because a lot of our overseas positions are not just field-based. They could be in Addis Ababa, Geneva, New York. 
all of our vacancies, most of them, and all of our organizations are advertised on our respective websites. So that's how you apply. She, uh, Susan, I don't know if you were here for the how to apply presentation, but every organization has a website. Every organization lists the available vacancies, and then you need to fill out a very detailed online application. To add to that, for UNDP, um, for our recruitment, it takes approximately three months, and that's just an approximate. It really depends on, sometimes we need people from Afghanistan on a really short notice, so it might only take, you know, we, we really need them to start in two weeks' time. Sometimes the recruitment process might take even six months. In average, it's around, you know, three months. Um, if you're looking to find a job next year, um, I mean, I wouldn't start maybe then applying now, just keep your eyes open. But then at the same time, we advertise all our positions on a demand-driven basis. So if you find something interesting and you might want to be able to take that in, you know, five, six months' time, I would go for it just to make sure that you, you don't miss it because the opportunity might not come along in the, you know, the next few years again. Okay. Yeah, UNFPA has been in Brazil since 1973, 40 years. I guess the point is that uh, if you are looking for a job at the UN, I think the first thing you should do, as the point was made, is look throughout and understand that there are many, many organizations in the UN. Okay, the question on the YPP. Someone took the YPP, they made it to take the written exam, but then they want to know why weren't they selected for the second part of the exam, which is the oral. First, let me be clear. Everybody that takes the YPP is from an un- or underrepresented country. So we don't have any quotas. We, once you take the exam, you are graded blindly. So the graders are not going to know your nationality. They're not going to know your gender. They are going to grade purely on the quality of the response as compared with the other responses. Most of what they're looking for is substantive knowledge as applied to the scenario or to the questions. So they're looking for your drafting ability, your analytic skills, and how you convey that. So I can't say what your exam was, but out of 5,000 people that are convoked, and we only interview, so 5,000 people will take the written, we will only end up interviewing approximately 180 or so for approximately 100 to 125 jobs. So the people that are grading it, so for social affairs, the people that would be grading it would be people in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And they would be reading, say, 400, I don't know how many people, 1,000 exams, and pretty much taking the best of the best. They don't know what your nationality is. They don't know you're just a number. So, yes. Well, there are Brazilians who have made it, so, so it's granted most countries English is not the first language. So yes, you do, we are looking for excellent English, but uh, also you can do the exam in any of the official languages. You have to do the summary in English and French, but for the substantive portion of the exam, you can write it in any of our official languages and it will be graded. But I mean, the fact is that drafting is critical at the UN and um, you have to be a strong drafter in English or I'm French. going to take you outside, but just to, to bear in mind, we do consider that you do not have English as your mother tongue and we do consider it. But you have to understand that we are hiring you to work in our environment. 
So therefore, you have to be able to work in English. So we will be looking at that during the interview. For each individual uh, written exam, there are three markers that, uh, that mark the exam separately. If there is a problem on the marking because it's very different, it goes to a board. And if the board doesn't agree, then I have to intervene. But at that point in time, I don't know even whether you are Brazilian or whether you are from Rwanda. We, we mark the exam blindly at that point in time. Only at the time of the interview will we know your nationality. Or gender. But we have to be very clear, it is the top that pass the exam. And unfortunately, if we only have 100 or 120 positions, we have to have a, 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 um, a line that will mark or not, uh, that you will pass or not pass. So that is the reality. So can, because we have to finish at around 8.30, why don't you wait at the end and I'll cover you. So three more questions from here. So, okay. She already has the microphone. Yes. <laughs> okay, start. Um, the, first, the first one is um, when you guys talking about five years of experience, it could be inter internship or training programs. Uh, it could be considered like um, experience. And the other one is how can we prepare to YPP because I know uh, we have to take tests and how can we study for that? And I know that that is uh, the website, but there is a book, some advice that you can give to us. Okay, there was someone at the back. No, all right, here. Oh no, you did an interview. I, ne I need to hear someone else after. Uh, my question is directly to Harold, I think, because I, I was wondering if you can tell us about your experience as a volunteer. Volunteer? Uh, yeah. No, he was a oh, JPO. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So what do you want to know as a volunteer? Uh, everything, actually. Because <laughs> I, I do not have five years of job experience, so I'm thinking about become a volunteer. So, but so go for it. Yeah, yeah I, I will. I will. <laughs> okay, so there's another one. So that is not a non-question. <laughs> well, uh, my question is uh, about the the need uh, of the international, the previous international experience. I have some friends that uh, got very good positions at other international organizations like the World Bank or the IMF without having previous international experience. I totally understand that uh, for UN and for, especially for some of the UN organizations, this is almost uh, uh, a total requirement. So, But uh, I'd like to ask you, what kind of um, experience or what, ki what kind of assets you could have in order to suit? But you have other other things that maybe can substitute for that. Okay. I don't know, publications or education. We got it. Last question. There was someone there. Uh, good evening. I'd like to ask you about uh, your, your experience as UN workers, how you got to adapt to so many different places. You and your family, of course, because I have family, and I'm quite worried about that. Okay, so that we will do at the end when we wrap it up. So non-question. Anyone else has a question here? No, so you have a question. Uh, it is uh, one. Okay, Why? so after, can I ask, with my, uh, can I talk to you with Matheus regarding the YPP uh, doubts? Because I also took the YPP written exam. But my question, my question is about cover letter. Yes, um, I I always try to apply uh, as in the Inspira uh, dot com, and um, I as a note, uh, F you were explaining about the interview, may I use the same skills, the same tips for the interview to build uh, a unique cover letter to each uh, vacancy I am applying for? Because uh, I don't know when I 
try to 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 do all the time a different cover letter. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So who wants to take the last one? Cover letter. Mm -hmm. Yes, you must tailor. I mean, this is not even a doubt. If you want a job, you must tailor your cover letter to the specific job that you're applying for. Because otherwise, it's just generic, and we have too many people that want it and are putting the time to tailor it. It's also how you sell us and convince us that you are the right person for the job. If we have 500 people and they all have the same degree and relatively the same experience, this is what will tip you over the edge as compared to someone else. And I'll just take the YPP, how to study for the YPP. Depending on what area you're taking it in, if it's law or um, statistics, there are certain fundamental principles that we expect you to know in that substantive area. You don't need to be an expert, but you need to know the basics of whatever area you're taking it in. Then you need to look at past exams and see the types of questions that we ask. Nine times out of 10, we are not looking for a right answer. We're looking, as I said to the gentleman, how do you analyze? How do you apply facts to a situation? How do you convey? Also, then you need to practice summarizing, because the first part of the exam is doing a summary. So reading an article in The Economist and summarizing it in English or French, reading an article um, in some other international magazine. Then you need to familiarize yourself with the UN, the different agencies, some secretary general's reports in the area that you're taking the exam. The more that you can know about the area and just generally very few of the questions are going to be specific fact-oriented. Most of the written portion that we're going to be grading you on in the substance area is your analytic ability and your uh, expertise in the fundamental principles of whatever the area is. Except for statistics where they will be having real problems and mathematical things. Answer the question on the, the internships and um, volunteer experience if you should. Well, you should definitely mention that in your application, but it doesn't count towards the required years of experience. And at the back, I think you also asked whether you should mention extracurricular activities. You should mention everything that you think that is relevant to the position. Even, even though it doesn't count towards the required years, it still makes you stand apart from the others. And definitely, if you worked as a volunteer, yeah, mention everything in the in the CV or in the application form. Uh, to the okay, it works. To the gentleman that asked about the international experience, um, it's not a requirement. It's it's a desirable advantage. Um, you know, most of us here are recruiters or have been recruiters in our time, and um, it's not a prerequisite for you to have international experience, it definitely helps. It adds value and weight to your application. But I know that I've seen people and have been in involved in recruitment processes where an individual hasn't had that international exposure. I think what is key is motivation. If you're motivated to go to these places, you don't necessarily have to have been there before. Um, so I think it's a little bit of a myth that's out there that you have to have international experience before you can come and work with us. It's really not true. We, we assess you on your merit and what you can bring to the role and what you can bring to the organization and also your motivation uh, to go and work in the locations where we serve. Also, if I can quickly add to that, international experience could be working for a global company as well. It doesn't have to be working for another UN agency. It could be that you work for you know, one of these multinational companies for example, in, in HR and your global HR director, obviously then you have international experience. So it's not really that you have to work just for the UN before. 
Okay, at this point, we have arrived to the end. We are each one of us going to give you our final words, including what it is to be a UN staff member, and that will include Harold specifically regarding his family. But before that, I want to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for inviting us and having us here and having you here. I want to thank each and every one of you. I know you did an effort after work to come here and be with us, so we really appreciate it. Uh, you coming here is a great motivation for us, and uh, it keeps us going. So really, thank you so much for coming. So on that note, each one of us will say some final words, and I know some of you want to speak to us uh, separately at the end. So Harold, you start first. Remember, I always ask uh, ladies and gentlemen who goes first. This time, I just pick up. He has to go first. So Harold. Thank you, Marta. I guess um, I try to give a testimony of my experience, and I believe uh, the first thing I, I, I should say is that you know, we took it one, one step at a time, because I, I think we did not start off with a decision of leaving our country, Costa Rica, forever. We happen to have a country that a lot of people think is very nice, and we do think is very nice. My wife had a career. In fact, she had a dual career over there. So we knew it was going to be difficult. That continues to be a challenge. I'm going to say the pluses and the negatives. Uh, couples in the UN, uh, you know, struggle because one of them typically uh, doesn't really, uh, is not able to get the same kind of, uh, you know, professional, you know, accommodation as, as the other. And we decided that each, we're going to, we were going to look at each posting and so far it has been seven. So you know, I guess my wife, who has been the person who has to be flexible, uh, has agreed to that. And I believe that is because um, I think she has been able to you know, build something out of this difficult situation. She, she has several, you know, she's an anthropologist. She, she's, she, she has a master's in, in, in gender uh, issues. And she's also a poet. You know, and she has, each country is different, but she tries to accommodate that. Um, we decided early on that we were not going to have separate lives because she got, uh, she, I, I got posted to El Salvador and she got an offer in Angola and she said, no, I, it's not going to work. I've seen people who actually do that. You know, they commute. They commute across continents sometimes. You know, I, for us, it, it was not going to work. At the end, uh, we believe, uh, forget about professionally, I think we are very, sa I am very satisfied professionally, and I think she, eventually she is, you know, in a way. Um, what, the, what the difference has made is what our kids have turned out to be, you know. Our kids have become international, truly international uh, kids. You know, speaking many languages, they went to school in seven countries. You know, when you do your primary and you are in three countries in primary school and then in three countries in secondary, you know, you eventually can work, you can operate in any country. And I'm not saying this because of me, but because my kids actually told me that they wouldn't change their lives, you know, for anything else. Despite the fact that every time we move from a country, it's a very difficult thing. You know, you're saying goodbye to the friends. Uh, and now saying goodbye, I don't know, hopefully, I don't know if they're going to say goodbye to the girlfriend or boyfriend, but, you know, it's that. Um, one thing that I should say, the UN has allowed me to give my, my, my kids the best education uh, you know, the world can offer. Because this is your choice, you can send your kids to, 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 to study where, 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 wherever they want to study. So I think all in all, you know, despite many difficulties, I've, I'm going gonna, gonna to say this because you need to know it. You know, you're going to get, you're going to dread that call in the night, someone telling you, delivering you a bad news. But I guess that's part of the job. And I experienced that twice here in Brazil, you know. Your brother is going to call you at 3 a.m. in the morning, I'm going to give you bad news. That comes with the job. You know, that's part of the decision. You have to be prepared. All in all, I, I wouldn't change my life. I, it has been a great life. I'm very motivated. It's good to get a good package, but also think that you're contributing to building a, a, a better world. Uh, just to echo what Harold said, I think for us working at the UN, it's not just a job, it's a vocation. And so it is a life, 
choice. You don't have to do it forever. You can do it for two years and then take a break and come back. But I think it's so difficult to get in that once you're in, you probably don't necessarily want to leave. But the, for me, I've had, I've traveled to over 50 different countries. What really motivates me and it motivated me from when I was an intern is working with the people from different nationalities every single day. My best friend is South Korean, a boy. You, you, you know, I never in a million years would have said that would be my best friend. And our teams are always different nationalities. And that can also, trust me, be challenging at times. But the heart and soul for me of the UN is the working with the different people from all over. And if you get energy from that, which I do, you can't put that into money, dollars, anything. It's the best. Yeah, and I can only echo what Harold and Lynn already said. I mean, there are so many, there are some sacrifices you have to make. There are some challenges. Um, but then again, it's all fine when you really want to work for the UN. I mean, having a UN career is, uh, is a choice. Nobody, nobody forces, nobody, uh, the UN doesn't call you and, you know, ask you to work for them. You really have to have the drive to work. And if you have to, the, the drive, then you put up with the challenges. I mean, they, they are big ones, but then, I mean, that's just something that comes with the lifestyle. And um, I'm, I'm very happy that I, I made the choice. And could be that there'll, there'll be some times in my life that I might have to leave the, the system to maybe go back home. But you have to be flexible as well. You could come back maybe after five years, ten years. You never know. So you have to be flexible. Um, and you can't really plan ahead too much either because... It's an international career, and even if you plan to have a UN career, it, most of the cases it means that you have to go to different countries. You can't just plan to have a UN career in New York. That would not work. So you have to be very flexible. Thanks. I guess I'll, I'll leave the, the final thoughts or the penultimate thoughts. Um, we have a saying in the UN that we recognize that it's hard to get into the UN, but it's even harder to leave the UN. And it's harder to leave the UN because once we're in, we really just don't want to leave. It's a wonderful, diverse family. It's probably the most diverse organization in the world. It offers you wonderful opportunities if you're open to taking them. So especially if you're a single person, you can take a lot of different opportunities before you decide to settle down. To the gentleman in the front row, you know, I, all I want to say to you is just don't give up. Please never give up. There's so many people who have made a dozen, two dozen applications before they've even just got to the interview phase. And that's completely normal. We're one of the biggest organizations in the world. We receive thousands of applications per year. But you'll get there eventually if you persist, if you keep motivated, and if you don't give up. And trust me, it'll be worth it. And I think a couple of my favorite things about working for the UN is that I think every job that I've held so far, I've been allowed to be creative. And I can be as creative as I want to be, or as uncreative as I want to be. And I just love the fact that I can be a creative person. And, um, and also, I just love working with just a wonderfully rich, diverse family. I mean, look at us. We all come from different continents, different backgrounds, different countries. I mean, where else would you be able to stand on a stage and say that? I think only really in the United Nations. And finally, I've, you know, I, I'm pretty new to the organization in a way. I'm, I'm maybe eight years in. Um, but I've seen the organization evolve in those eight years, and I'm really excited to see it continue to evolve and to see the impact of its evolution as well in the future. Um, so those are my final words this evening. Thank you. Okay, there's not much to say. Uh, they have said practically everything to, to you. I'll just say it from the perspective of a manager uh, and uh, and, and one of the leaders of the organization, it is a pleasure to be a, a manager in the organization. And I look at some of you that could be a manager. Having such a wonderful team, it's, <laughs> she's nice. okay. it's a challenge. It's nice to see how each one of you in your different uh, cultures, you negotiate differently, you speak differently, you work differently. And uh, it, it, it poses us a lot of challenges during the day. But the beauty of it is that we know that each one of us is contributing something in the world. We have thousands of people, people working in the UN system. 
We have, for example, a UNFPA staff members here in Brazil and in the rest of the world trying to reduce birth mortality. It is amazing that currently we still have that. Uh, with UNDP, we are still supporting countries. And when I was in UNDP, we had a big project in supporting electricity in Iraq. And still we have a number of areas. So there's still a lot to go. And even with the UN system. As a woman, I feel privileged with the career that I have had. I'm privileged to work in a, an organization that is helping girls all around the world and women around the world to make a contribution to the world. And I also thank my male colleagues in helping us and fighting for us around the world. I hope to see you in our corridors, but it may not be the situation. So I wish you a wonderful career. And most of all, I wish you a wonderful life. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being interested in the organization. And above all, thank you for the ideals of the organization that we all truly have in our heart. And we join them every single day. So thank you to you and thank you to the ministry. So now we open it to questions and answers. OK. So oh, we can leave it. All right. So any question, it can be from the presentations, it can be from something you have read in, in the newspaper, something you, you have served in the web, it can be something regarding our lives, how we joined, what is our daily work, whatever you want, we are here for you to, to, to clarify. So let me start with this group. Any questions from this side? Just one second, just one second, someone is going to give you the microphone. Well, uh, um, it's, it's very short. I just want to know where I can have more information about uh, things like uh, um, the position, what, what people are going to be, how hard it looks uh, concerning with uh, leaving and the place to live, for example, how, how uh, people have to rent a house by themselves, for example. Well, we, we, if you don't want to, don't need to, to answer right now because I have some more questions and I, I would like to ask you later. That's why I, I, I told them that it would be short. Okay, so as, as we are small group, so, what is your next question? And, um, well, about uh, uh, salary, transportation, uh, if you have family, do, do you pay for the family bill too? And uh, things like that. Okay, I think we got a gist of what you want. All right, anyone else from this group? So it was said that lawyers and legal affairs are very needed in the UN. And I was wondering what kind of experience a lawyer can have. So because every country has a different legal system and everything. And what kind of experience could I have? For example, if I'm a judge in Brazil in a civil court, would that count as a, an experience? And for example, you ask for five years. But what would be five years after I graduate, whatever I do? Or does it have to be exactly related? And what in a lawyer do you want? Do you want just human rights or you know, consumers' rights? Got it. I don't know. Good. All right. Um, how many questions are we going to have from this group? Only one? Okay, so we'll take it. studying international relations and I was thinking about the diplomat career and I say that one of the major problems uh, being a diplomat is that it's very hard for you to have a family to have a stable basis because you are always changing the place you live uh, each two years uh, so it's very hard to marry to have children and I would like to know that it's the same work in the UN because I know you travel a lot but from what I understand you have a, a 
a living basis, you live in one place and you travel to some other countries, but you don't keep changing all the time. And I would like to know that if uh, you have the same problem or is it easier in the UN than to be in a diplomat career. Okay, good. All right, so the compensation package, except Lynn. Mary, do you want to take it? Or Susan? Um, yeah, I, I guess so. Um, your questions are very valid. I think um, we will contemplate your questions at some point or another. Our compensation package um, is set by the International Civil Service Commission, um, and we have details on the website. There's actually a, a tool, a calculator, where you can punch in the grade of the position that you're applying to, the location, and it will give you an indication, just an approximate indication of how much you would be earning. Um, we work on a grade-based system, like many civil service um, civil service organisations around the world. Um, so your salary is a reflection of your grade. Uh, so it's quite easy to figure out. But just look on the website; you'll find the tool. And um, for young professionals, entry level, you should be looking around the P2 level. So that would give you an indication. Um, with regards to living accommodation. Um, we do have some support facilities if you were moving to New York. We have a housing office to guide you as to where you could possibly rent apartments. We also have networks of people who can just give you their experience and best practices. Um, if you're going to field locations, um, we have an informal approach. You know, the staff members currently living there with families or without families will give you the best advice. And, you know, maybe there's somebody leaving, so you can just take over the lease on their apartment. Um, again, with transportation, just do your homework in advance. If you're coming to New York or Geneva or to Bangkok, there's transportation facilities. If you're going to maybe a little bit of a more lo uh, remote location, um, it may be that um, you could hire a driver. A lot of our staff do that in the field missions. They, they hire a driver in a car, or they just buy their own car and drive around. Um, if you're traveling, uh, for us and with us, and you're based in one of our field missions, you would be escorted by our security officers to and from your compound or your living area to the airport. So there's lots of different ways. You have to do your homework. We can link you in with our staff currently in those locations, and they can share their ideas and best practices. And it, it, it's not a problem. There's a lot of information out there. Just to, to clarify, it depends on the duty station you're going. So we cannot respond, let's say, the same for New York or the same for Afghanistan. Okay, so it depends on your duty station. If it's New York, Geneva, and Vienna, obviously the conditions are much clearer for some of the other locations, as, as uh, Susan has indicated. Uh, we have more restrictions for security. Some restrictions go up to the escort. We try not to, but in some situations we just have to, and it's in your interest. Yeah. I, can, I can tell you about Libya afterwards. Oh, she's an expert in Libya. Okay. All right. Uh, the legal. The legal question. Oh, Lynn is going to leave okay. one. The legal question, and this answer also applies to almost any discipline, economics, international affairs, um, business administration. Uh, as a lawyer in the UN, we don't follow any individual country's uh, legal system unless you're doing some kind of contractual work in which you would be trained in the, how the UN does contracts. So we follow international law. So even though I'm an American lawyer, we're not applying US law, we're applying international law. So that's the first thing. So it doesn't matter, we have lawyers from Brazil, from Spain, from uh, any country you can think of. So it doesn't matter what your legal training is. Uh, what we're looking for in in all of our substantive areas are people with good drafting. So working uh, for a judge could be very useful if you were drafting some opinions for him uh, We're looking for good analytic skills for the lawyers, people who can frame issues, 
uh, there are many, many different areas you can work as a lawyer, and it's based on your skill set. Yes, I started as a human rights lawyer, but then I worked as a treaty law lawyer. Many of the skills about treaty law I learned at the UN. So it's more about your ability to do research, to analyze. Uh, there, we have lawyers who are child protection lawyers. We have lawyers who deal with contracts, who deal with issues of privileges and immunities. So it's not so much the substance, but when you would apply for a job or to take the YPP in law, you need to know some fundamental legal principles. We have sample exams um, on the website for law and for every area. So you would look at those and see what are the legal principles that we're um, asking about. But it wouldn't be to one country's. Does that answer your question? OK. And then your question, we're going to leave until the end. Is that OK? When we say what have been our experiences in a different context. So let's go here. Are there any questions from this side? I want to know how to, uh, when I start at UN or, you know, the, these agencies, and to change areas as you start in human rights, then to go to the uh, from people, UN and change to other areas of the UN. Is that possible? Is that easy? Or you need to have, uh, let's say, someone to uh, give you some space or something like that? OK, good. Any other questions from this side? Any final questions from this group? Uh, hello. Uh. As a geographer, I work with the satellite images and stuff like that. And then I would like to know how the UN works with this kind of stuff. OK, good. <laughs> you got us excited, right? <laughs> and any other final question from here? Sure? No? OK. So. Okay, we'll do changing the job, so. Okay, just uh, like all of you have to compete um, for different jobs, even when we're in the UN, we too have to do the exact same process as you. We're not treated differently. So to change jobs, yes, you can do it. I've done it, Susan has done it, Marta has done it, Marie's in her first job, but she will do it. Um, you need to apply and do exactly what we're telling you. But uh, it's a little bit easier because you're more familiar with the situation and what is required so you can tailor your application more. Plus, you have some experience that's also useful. And as you go and build your careers, each step is the next step. So, you know, I didn't go from being a lawyer to being an engineer, but I went from being a lawyer doing human rights to doing treaty law to working in administrative law to working in HR doing human resources policy, and then made a jump to where I'm not doing any law. So other people have gone to different organizations. So the more experience you get as you mature in your careers, even if it's not with the UN, um, is useful for whatever you're going to apply to. So yes, it's still difficult when we're in this situation. We still have to make a good application a good cover letter and a good interview, but because we also have more experience, we become more competitive as well. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, do you want to take the agenda? Oh, yes. Look, look at her eyes. Maps. We love maps in peacekeeping. 
Um, so uh, please tell me uh, if the rest of the Secretariat uses maps, because I can only tell you from a peacekeeping and a field perspective, but we love maps in peacekeeping. They drive everything that we do. Uh, we also use a lot of maps for publications, which I'll get to in a second, but we, we need satellite imagery. That's a given. It's so vitally important to us in the field in peacekeeping and special political missions. Quite honestly, we, this is where we use the military and the uniformed personnel to help us a lot. They do a lot of the satellite imagery for us, but we do have civilians working in the mission who will work alongside the military doing the satellite imagery and then feed all of that back into our cartography section based in New York. Now, what the cartography section uses the maps for in New York is to help us with pre-mission planning. So if you take the example of Mali, this is our new baby, our new mission, the newest startup mission that we have. It's maybe two weeks, two weeks into the planning. We've determined that we're going to place the peacekeeping mission in the very north of Mali. It's, it's a very unhabited area. Um, it's not the capital. There isn't so much information about the scope of the land, how we can get logistics in, how we're going to get the logistics in, through which countries, which borders. Um, so we need the satellite imagery and we need the mapping and the cartographers to consider the lay of the land, how we can build the compound, um, and we use the mapping for this purpose. And as I say, we use the mapping to plan how we can bring the logistics in as well. We, we experienced... Um, some challenges when we set up our mission in South Sudan a couple of years ago because there were some issues with borders and we had to rethink how we can bring goods and services down from Italy where we have warehouses of goods and services, our main logistical hub in Brindisi in Italy and how we could bring them down and through Africa into South Sudan given some border disputes and some issues with some governments. So mapping can be useful for many reasons. Um, it's also useful for the Department of Public Information um, to show people where we work and to show people where borders and land disputes are. And for many publications and magazines, we also have a fact sheet which we update every month and um, we use mapping for those fact sheets as well. So cartography is not a huge section in the United Nations. It's vitally important for the field. Um, we do have a roster of cartographers, um, so I would be very interested if you were to come and apply with us one day, uh, because we don't have that many cartographers that actively come along and want to join us. Um, maybe they just don't know that we have jobs for them. I don't know. But please remember this, and when the time comes, and when you have a little bit more experience, I hope that you would be interested in joining us. Just to let you know, uh, it is the only section on cartography besides WMO, and it's used by all the field-oriented organizations, UNICEF, UNDP. When I was both in UNICEF and UNDP, we relied on the maps of the cartography produced by uh, DFS. And the reason for it is that they go to the minute detail of where we have to support the local community for vaccinations, for delivering food, so therefore, it does give us a much more detail of the, the far apart locations where we have to be considering, particularly for health reasons and nutrition reasons. So that is why this division, although small, plays a big um, um, role for security and for all the other areas. The other area that is looking at, uh, that has also satellite imagery but from a different angle is the meteorological organization and that obviously is because of the weather so it's from another angle that they are looking for that imagery that is required all right so we have the geography we have the legal have we missed anyone else just the diplomatic, just the diplomatic but that goes at the end so no nothing else so at the end i'm going to ask uh, mary lynn and susan to give you uh, their final words, but also in a certain way to address Guillermo's concern of what it is to be an international civil servant vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a diplomat that is a bit different, but also with many things that are the same. So, Mary. Okay, so um, to work in the UN is really a career choice. I mean, you have to make the choice. It's not for everybody, um, and you have to sacrifice certain things. Um, so it could be that, for example, 
from my experience when I mean I knew when I got offered the, the position that I want to take it so I was ready to leave my family leave my boyfriend leave my friends move to New York start a completely new life it was I mean I I, I knew that it was the right thing for me. It's not for everybody, so you have to really know because you have to sacrifice certain things. But then again, I know that I can do it only if I want to go back to my home country, for example, after a few years, I can do that. And I, I mean, there are so many different, um, different models. There are so many different career paths. There are so many different personalities in the system and different situations. Some people come with a family and they make you work. There are, you know, your UN um, uh, careers, you could make it work if, it, if you feel that it's the, the right choice for you. And I really encourage if, you, if you're inspired by our experiences, by our discussion, to, to look into the opportunities because it's a great, great place to work. You get to, to work with people from all different cultures. You get to, um, you, you're just exposed to so many different things. So it's, it's nothing that you can experience in, in your home country. So it's really a unique experience. So if you're interested, go for it. I met one of my husbands uh, working for the UN. So a lot of people meet their spouses in the UN. There are many women and men married, long marriages, lots of children. But as Mary said, um, it is uh, not as straightforward as if you're just um, staying in Brasilia for the rest of your life, which could also be a great thing for your children because they grow up experiencing different cultures. Uh, you can also start, as I did, I started my career working in the field. So in my 30s, I was out and about, and then now, for the last... Uh, 15 years, I've been in New York. So I've been in different jobs in New York. But that also, there's a sacrifice in that because it's more competitive to get to the higher levels. So it just depends on what moves you. For me, there's no choice. I could not work just with one nationality, my own nationality. I get energy working with people from all over the world. The same thing that attracted me when I was an intern and why I wanted to work at the UN then is what drives me every day. I love these guys. Uh, Mary, last year we were in Finland for my birthday and I'm very much a baby about my birthday and she planned this whole birthday surprise for me in Finland. So what I'm saying is in so many ways uh, the colleagues you work with, particularly in the difficult situations, become your family and it's very difficult. I still have my family, but I, it's more than just a job. It really is a vocation if you want to work with us. Thanks. I think the way that I look at it is, you know some things about us now, and we know some things about you. So we know that you're young, you're ambitious, you've got a career ahead of you, you're for the most part, I think, under 32, which is great. You've got your whole lives ahead of you. You can afford to take a little bit of risk as well with your career. And what you've just learned about us is that we're interested in bringing a new generation in to our organization. We're looking for the next generation, which could be you. We're looking for new, fresh, young talent to invigorate us. And so give us a try. What's the worst that can happen? If you don't like us, that's fine. You're still young. You can move on and find whatever your calling is in life. But I just think back to when I was 30 and I took my first job. It was a one-year contract as a consultant with where Mary works in UNDP. And, and I just said to myself, what's the worst that can happen? I can either have a great year, decide to stay, hopefully find another job with the United Nations, and I did. Or I can go back to London and go back to my old job and my old life, and, and that's good too. So, you know, give us a try. You never know. We have so much to offer you. We have such a wonderful, diverse group of colleagues. You'll never find an organization as diverse as us. You work with people from all different cultures, all different backgrounds. You can move practically any continent in the world and experience something new. And where else are you going to find that in the world? So that's, you know, what I would leave you with. What's the worst that can happen? You may just end up loving us 
and want to work with us for the rest of your lives. Okay, uh, I think my colleagues have said most of what I, I would have said. Um, you know yourselves and you, you will reflect after we go whether or not this is the life for you or partial life for you. It, it doesn't have to be forever. But we all um, are, um, go to our offices every morning enjoying what we do. The UN is not perfect. It's like any other company. And our days have our challenges as in an outside company. But what really motivates us to come to every day is because we know that whether us or our colleagues are making a difference in the world. And I think that is what really motivates us. We really do not want the situation of the 1940s to happen again. And so therefore we would make every possible effort to make uh, a difference and to contribute to uh, countries like Brazil, we are present here, but other countries where they will have more necessities and more work to be done and because we believe in the values of the UN and that is really what motivates us to come. You can contribute in different manners. If you do feel that this is not your life for you, coming here is already contributing to the UN because you are interested and you believe in us. Spreading the word can also be the same. Or contributing in other ways that do reflect our values. So on that note, I do want to thank you for coming. We would not be able to do this without you here. You being here is a motivation for us. As Susan said, you're the young talent and, and for me as a manager, one of the the beauties of being a manager is to having uh, the, the whole team and a whole uh, wonderful team with different nationalities, different ways of thinking, different problems, and they entertain me every single day. But the most beautiful thing is to see the young talent that will be there when I am not there, and that will taking the baton of the United Nations. So thank you so much, and I do want to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for uh, organizing this and having this wonderful room. We took a picture yesterday of this room and I sent it to my husband who used to work here many years back and uh, when he was posted here and he said the room looks practically the same as he saw it nearly 30 years ago. So thank you so much for coming. We wish you all the very best. We wish you a wonderful career whether it's with us or in the outside world but we also wish you a wonderful life enjoy your lives and we hope to see you in our corridors thank you so much okay so um uh, now that we did the interview um exercise we're going to open it to questions and answers so um what we are going to be uh, uh, you can ask anything you can ask about the presentation. You can ask about our lives. Between each one of us, we have had different lives in the UN. So if you feel that there's something bothering you, we'll try to answer it. So some of us are married, some of us are not married, some of us have boyfriends or not girlfriends because we, uh, 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 Harold is married. But anything, anything, it can be simple and you may think that is not important. Feel free to ask whatever you want. Is it clear? Yes? Obviously, we will continue. So, let me start. Uh, I have some volunteers. What's the, what's the name of the... Ba better? My no, name? no, no. The, the, the one who Volunteer. has the microphone. What's your name? It's Luana. What? Luana. 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 Okay, yes. so Luana. At the back, we are going to start by sections. We have to be very organized. I'm the director of planning and organizing. All right, <laughs> planning, strategic planning. So from the back, can you take three questions? Hello. Uh. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Barbara Barbara. I just had uh, just got my, got my degree in international relations at the University of Brasilia. And usually in Brazil, we start working at the middle of our degree. 
So since the second year, I had some professional experiences as an intern or as, well, volunteer work at, N at NGOs. And I'd like to know if that counts as experience. Because, well, I, I worked in other countries and I was vice president of an NGO here and I'm not the only one and, and I'd like to know if this counts for the, well, for, the, for starting my career at the United Nations. Thank you. Okay, good. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you to you for coming. The next question or concern. Well, uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm a student at University of Brasilia in the Master Degree of International Relations. And as I told you before, I'm Colombian. And specifically, I'd like to know more about your experience, Marta, uh, since you are Colombian as well. Uh, and I, I uh, as, well, as I've heard, this recruitment is like based more for Brazilians. And I don't know, like, uh, I don't know if it's only for the YPP program or for all the all the all the programs that you showed before. That I don't know. Yeah, I'd like to know more about your experience. Okay. Uh, any other questions at the back? No. All right. So, who wants to take the first question? Okay, Lynn and Mary. Okay, uh, we start counting for relevant professional experience after your first level degree. So while we would think it was interesting, everything you did during your university years, it wouldn't count as professional. So yes, you would put it on your application, but it wouldn't go to the five years. So for example, if you're applying for YPP, this would be excellent, you know. Um, and for any other job, we want to know your internships and everything that you've done. But counting experience is after the first level degree, and it's generally paid. And to add to, add to that, uh, internships don't normally count towards um, accumulating any, any experience. I just compl in some of the UN system organizations, they do count it. So uh, just in case for you to know, but in general, this is the principle of the majority of the organizations. And now some of the organizations have started to put it specifically in the vacancy announcement. Regarding uh, the audience of this, the audience of this has mainly been young professionals. Obviously, Brazilians in the sense that we do have a YPP program this year, but it also covers all the other entry points that do apply for Colombians or any young professional. The UNVs, the UNVs is one way of contributing to the UN system, and therefore it is targeted also to young professionals. The LEAD program is another one, but obviously you would need a certain years of experience. So what we have tried to cover are the different ways of entering the UN at different stages in your life. Sometimes you join when you're very young, others have joined at their middle career, and we have others that have joined right at the end. They may be staff members or they may be contributing as consultants, as contractors, with all the experience they gain throughout the careers. We have also UNVs that retire um, from the private sector and then come and work with us to contribute to the UN. So it covers all the areas. Regarding my experience in the UN, I'm going to leave that right until the end, all right? Because each one will say something. So just remind me that I don't miss that one until the end. So now let's cover this. So why didn't you post the question when I said, is there any one other? Sorry, I just remember now. You Make just remembered? Questions. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, quickly. Okay, my name is Oscar. I'm doing doctor degree here in uh, international relations. I'm staying for the next season of the next um, um, speaker. But uh, at now, I would like to know, because I have like a brother that had disability, and if you have some uh, special vacancies for those kind of persons, or you have some some way uh, different, or is the same thing for everyone? Um, because in Brazil we have like, and um, five percent of all the vacations is for special people. So I just would like to know about this. 
Okay, so now we'll answer that question in the next group. Now here, uh, let's take three questions. So there may be more hands up, but we'll take three from this side. What's the name of the lady in blue? Your name? Paula. Paula. Okay, Paula, you choose the three. Um, hi, my name is Vanessa. I have a question concer concerning consultancies, because I myself was a consultant before for uh, an NGO. And I was wondering if you have the same benefits or some benefits for consultants as you have for volunteers and obviously not like staff. Or, and also, how could a consultancy lead up to a, a bigger position in the UN? Thank you. Okay, second question from this group. Wait, I think I have the mic. Yeah. Uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, I Wait one second, did Paula choose you? Yeah. Are you sure? Paula. She, somebody gave me the mic. Okay, don't worry, I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Daniel, uh, I've been now uh, uh, I've graduated now three years of international relations here at Brasilia and uh, I've applied for uh, YPP twice now and I've, I failed to meet the criteria I think uh, for going to, 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 to take the test right and uh, now I feel I, I have three years of experience in, uh, 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 in economics and I feel like I'm some sort of limbo where do I, do I take the YPP again because it's an opportunity and I meet the criteria the, the, the base and basic uh, 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 requirements, or if I go to UNV, something that I always wanted to do, or if I wait for a couple of years to get the, the, the experience for the five years, and maybe go to another level interest in, at the UN. So I don't know if you have any, any sort of, of, of you know, commit, uh, uh, comments on this for, for help me. Okay, good. Next, the third one. Uh, me, my name is Chila. I have a... Um I'm graduated in international relations, and now I'm also a UNHCR intern. And I can also say that uh, an unpaid internship is a great way to get more experience, but it can it can be very expensive. For me, I have to change cities, so I want to know if uh, UN offer any kind of uh, support to guarantee that all kind of all kind of young people with or without research can uh, have this experience. And my friend. I uh, want to know if you have... <laughs> oh, so you have one question, <laughs> A and B. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, she would like to know if you have uh, um, an example of teamwork and organizing, planning organizer to, to give her. Okay. All right. So, um, you take the YPP. Anyone wants to take any... Okay, so I'll take the disability. We do hire individuals and there's no discrimination with uh, certain disabilities. We do not have a quota. Uh, and the reason for it is we work throughout the world and there are certain locations that we will have to be a bit more restrictive uh, with uh, individuals with uh, those um, uh, disabilities. But for the YPP, you can apply and there's no restriction. Depending on the disability, we may have to uh, make certain arrangements. Sometimes we uh, have to reserve a separate room for uh, the individual. Others, for example, if you're blind, we will need to have a special, uh, it's the only way that you will not have to write. You will have to do it in a computer. So we will uh, pay for the renting of that equipment. If, uh, for example, you're an interpreter, and you do, uh, you do have some um, restrictions uh, in your hearing, we will be hiring the equipment. But it depends on the location. Uh, for some locations, particularly in the field, uh, not all our offices are disability um, uh, equipped, so therefore that is the restriction. So we do encourage you to uh, ask those individuals to apply, but we do not have a percentage. So on that note, I have here a wonderful team. So who's going to take the first one? Harold wants to take consultancy. And uh, wait one second. 
Harold was here. He's not from HR. He was so nervous this morning, he just met us, that he would not be able to answer any question. So I'm so happy that he has agreed to do this one. Uh, thanks. Um, on the consultants and the consultants, um, I didn't mention, but UNFPA, most of our of the people that work for us have a service contract, which is a contract that is not a, 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 a fixed term, and therefore those people are considered consultants. So we have a lot, I think, for UNFPA is a, is a very good entry point of people sometimes spend a lot of time as consultants and eventually uh, get the experience. In fact, locally we treat them as internal candidates when, when we do have a fixed term uh, process. A quick word on the internship and the hardship of those who want to, to be interns. Actually, we last year, here locally, we decided on a program to provide internship for people who actually didn't have resources to give it a stipend, not, not a big salary, but a stipend. So you can probably ask uh, uh, my colleague in UNSC, Andres, why is it that they're not giving us stipend? <laughs> okay, on the internship, there are very few offices that are able to do that. It is the General Assembly resolution that we should not pay for interns. So uh, we would all love to do that. We do have budgetary restrictions, but the main restriction is that the General Assembly has indicated that we should not pay for interns. So that is the main reason for it. You do have some organizations that officially their executive boards have authorized them. IFAD, IFAD is one of the organizations that is based in uh, Rome and is uh, dedicated to food and agriculture. They do pay for interns and also ILO. But they are very few, and if they do, it's because they are approved by their executive boards. Okay, the question, he's tried for the YPP a few times, hasn't uh, been convoked. Now he has three years of experience. Should he try for the YPP again? Should he try for the UNV? Should he wait? Everything. I, I don't know whether you even meet the requirements, honestly, for this year's YPP, because uh, I think you said you had economics or international relations, and we're, you, we need you to have a first level degree in either administration, law, uh, finance, uh, statistics, or whatever the fifth one is. So you have to see if you're even qualified. If you are qualified, absolutely apply because it doesn't cost anything and it's a weekend and you probably have your old application so you can improve it and the fact that you have English and more work experience can only help. By the same token, there's no guarantee, so of course you should apply for the UNV. The point is you need to have options and whether it's you or any of you, you don't just apply for one job and sit and think that you're going to get it. You apply for a job, you assume you're not going to get it, and you apply for 10 more because there's very stiff competition. You see how many are in this session? We have about 10 more sessions just in Brazil, and you're competing with a number of people worldwide. So you need to apply for as many jobs as you're qualified for, keep refining your applications, go at it from different angles, do the UNV thing probably in a year and a half when you already forgot about it, they're going to call you to go to Mozambique. You know, that's kind of how it works. And then don't give up on your dream. If you're still interested in two years, apply again. Okay. Um, Susan is going to be give a bit of clarification for the consultancies. Um, on the examples of teamwork, planning and organizing and everything, on our website, and particularly in the UN Secretariat, you have examples there. There is also a video where you can watch. So there is a good examples. But the most important is not to copy our examples. Each one of you is very different, is unique. And you have your own lives. And what we want is to know about you. Is it clear? Susan. Thanks. I can maybe give an example of teamwork as well because I've recently just uh, done one that was a little bit complex. Um, but I think it was Vanessa. Yeah. I, I wanted to answer your question about the role of a consultant and if you can transition over to become a staff member and what kind of benefits that you receive. Um, because it's a question that's dear to my heart. That's the way that I got my foot in the door. Um, 
I got my foot in the door as a consultant in the United Nations Development Programme where Mary works. I took a one-year contract. Um, I, I was paid um, a comparable salary uh, to the level, the staff level that I was working at, but I had to provide my own health insurance. Um, I obviously wasn't qualified, I wasn't eligible to enter the pension program at that point. And um, also, I, I wasn't entitled to any leave days, but I had a nice boss and she recognized that I worked long hours and, and she compensated me graciously. I actually have a consultant working for me now and I do the same with her. I believe that if you treat people respectfully and properly, they're gonna give back to you. So I give her time off in compensation. Um, once I became a consultant, the first couple of months I didn't know if I wanted to actually stay in the United Nations. I was just testing the waters. I realized that this is the environment that's for me. I want to work in it. And now I have to transition from becoming a consultant to becoming a staff member. And the way that I did that was I built personal networks. I figured out where in the Secretariat I wanted to work as a staff member, and that was peacekeeping. And I love peacekeeping because it's so fast-paced and dynamic, and it's so relevant to today's news. And that was where I wanted to be. So I started networking and building relationships with people who were already working in that office, and then I finally waited until a position was advertised. Once I applied, I'd already gained all of the knowledge about what I needed to know as a potential staff member in peacekeeping because I'd done my homework. I'd spoken to everyone in the office. I knew everything that they were looking for in a potential candidate, so I was able to sell myself in the interview properly. So I think, first of all, try and get your foot in the door as a consultant. And then once you are a consultant, network and understand and learn the position, uh, you know, the area that you would be interested in as a staff member. On the teamwork example, uh, two weeks ago, in New York, we were starting up a new mission in Mali, um, and it's going to be a very, very large mission. And um, the first people that we want to place into the mission are senior level people. Um, and we don't have rosters for senior level people. So I was part of a team of seven people uh, called a pre-mission planning team. And I am the person that does the outreach. I'm the one that goes out there and advertises and tries to identify very strong candidates to be considered. Um, so that was my role in the team. I was in charge of the public relations, the communications, the outreach, the advocacy for the positions to try and generate candidates, candidates and get them to apply. Um, so as a team member, I took the lead on securing funds to do some advertising, working with the proponent officers within the organization either in New York or in the field missions to draft advertisements, both in English and French, to identify publications that we could use. Uh, and we found a very good one in West Africa called Jeune Afrique. It's a French speaking publication. And, and then I set up all of the paperwork, the invoicing for the advertisement to be placed. And I did this within four days because we, we're very time conscious with these positions. And so I'm now waiting for the results. We now have the applications coming in, so my next step will be to measure the number of applications coming in and to see what the quality is like. Okay, so any questions from the middle? Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vitor. I'd like to know, uh, as a young professional, if I don't have five years of experience in the field, uh, can I still apply? And if I applied, uh, can I, I, I still have the chance of be called for the Vegas or not? Thank you. Okay, thank you. The other lady here. Oh, okay, so I want to know how old were you when you all got involved with the UN and really start like, working at the UN? How old were you? And the second thing, correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think I saw that you can be a graduate or if you're in a five-year college degree, if you could be on your fourth year when you apply or if I'm crazy. Okay, who wants to take those? Anyone? Okay. Five years, can he apply for a job if he has no experience? No. Can if, he... If, if the job requires five years. 
yes. But most of our jobs advertised require five years. Can he apply for the YPP if he has no experience? Yes. Can he apply for some consultancies with UNDP if he has no experience? Maybe. You have to look at each job. For most, I won't lie to you, for most of our jobs, we require experience. We're sending you to Mali, or you're going to take up an important project in Geneva. We need you to be able to have the past experience. However, that doesn't mean I joined the UN. I'm not telling, but it wasn't, no. I joined at 30. She joined at what, 26? 30? You don't look 30. 30. No, no, for Susan. 30. 30, whoa, 30. I will tell you when I joined at the end. But the point is, I had some experience, not a whole lot. I know people who took the YPP and they joined at 28. But mainly, it's very few of our, except for Marie, well, no, you had the EU, but first position. We all had two to four to five to 10 years of experience. So it's not like you just graduate and then start. So don't give up. This is something we're here to show you certain steps that you can take. To be a UNV, you only need two years. Uh, I forgot the second part of your question. S second, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, the, the years of ex For the internship only, we will take you, if you're in a graduate program, or some countries, they don't differentiate between undergraduate and graduate, so they have five-year programs. So we'll take you if you're in the fifth year of that program. That's solely for internship purposes. Okay. And then I did join when I was 25, so you can add the number. But I had worked before in two companies that are private companies. I did work through my university and then after that. All right. So we, we each one of us have different experience. The three last ones from here. So who is it? Who is going to choose the three from here? Hi, my name is Paulo. Uh, on the interview simulation, you had an evaluation board here. And I would like to know if the interviewee really happens and if the board interacts with the interviewee. Okay, is it clear? No, can you repeat it? If the body? If the board of evaluation interacts with the interviewee during the interview. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, continue. Next one. Hi, my name is Barbara, and I have worked as a SSA contract uh, at UNIFEM and later on at UN Women. And I realized that, unfortunately, the path to go to other careers within the UN is very hard as a consultant, right? And basically, um, I, I've noticed that JPO is a very great program to uh, to begin this path and unfortunately in Brazil um, I, I don't know what are the agreements um, with uh, from the the Brazilian government with the UN and I was wondering if you have any news on it and if there is that if we still can have hope uh, to join the the junior program okay and the last one the last question okay um, I'm Bruno and I'd like to know if uh, the experience, the professional experience of required for some positions, if they have to be in that certain field that you're applying for. Um, okay. And also if uh, some people here are curious about the first thing that you look at when you look at our resumes and our application forms. Thank you. Okay, so who of you wants to take any of the questions? 
Just about um, you and women and the JPO. Um, first of all, I think you have relevant experience. And for instance, I, I would definitely think that an organization like UNFPA, yeah, you could certainly look and you know apply. But the question about JPO, uh, which is you know a matter for the decision of Brazilian government, but your question seems to imply that JPO automatically is is a position in the in the UN. As a former JPO, I tell you, I still had to apply and go to the process that was the precursor of the league to get into the organization. So it's an ex excellent uh, uh, you know, program for, for experience, but you still have to go through the uh, recruiting process. Mm -hmm. Even as a staff member, we still have to apply for every single job. So even when you're in the organization, it's not any easier to get another job in the organization. The issue is still open with the government. In fact, we, we spoke about it this morning. But at this point in time, it's not uh, one possibility for you. But you have a, wonder, a, a full variety of possibilities that we have explained. And don't uh, exclude yourself from any of the other UN system organizations. Go beyond ours. Many of you have profiles that could fit some of the other profiles. Um, in the board, anyone wants to answer the board? Paolo, I think, yes. Uh, yes, the board interacts with the candidate. Usually there's a minimum, I mean, for the lower level positions, there's probably around four competencies that we test you on. And there's typically three board members or interview panel members, and each panel member is assigned a competency to test you on. So each one will interact with you. And we interact as a panel with each other. Um, beforehand to set the criteria by which we evaluate every single candidate that we interview by and also afterwards to discuss your answers to the, you know, the competencies that we were testing you on. And the last question, uh, does your experience have to be relevant to the job? You have to show me, I mean, I'm a lawyer, I'm doing a HR. Uh, Marie's International Relations, she's doing HR. We are looking, there will be certain educational requirements that you have, but they're broad. So it could be public admis administration, law, economics, or related field. But it's really your job to show us how your experience is relevant. Maybe we wouldn't see it but there's certain skills that you have which are perfect fit for the skills we're looking for in the job obviously if we're hiring for a medical position and you're an engineer or if we're hiring for an engineer and you're a lawyer so you have to use your judgment but political affairs legal economics to a certain degree there are um, occupational groups with overlap. And if I may just to add to that, even if you apply to one organization, tailor your application to each vacancy because you ask like what we, what is the first thing that we look for in, in an application? It really depends on the vacancies. Just make sure that you meet the requirements of that vacancy and really pay attention to the vacancy announcement. All right, um, we will have to come to the end now. I know you have a number of questions and concerns that you may have. Uh, we do have Facebook. Huh? Oh, yes, don't worry, I haven't forgotten. Uh, uh, you can ask some questions on Facebook to, to Lynn, even if it's regarding UNTP and the others, she will yes with the others, so feel free to do it. She wants more likes. Okay. So I'm going to ask each one of them to indicate their final words of wisdom. And that is when I say my, my what I'm going to say. So who wants to go first? Mary? Mary, your last words before we leave you. Because there's another group coming after here. Just to say that um, I hope you've got an overview of different opportunities that we have. It's not just the Secretariat. It's not just UNDP. There's a variety of organizations and agencies. And within them, there are a variety of profiles. Just be broad-minded when you, when you look into opportunities in the, in the UN. I've said enough. I just want to say that uh, I think today, it's as Marie said, it's the beginning. 
We're not giving you the answers. We're hopefully giving you a place to start to find the answers for yourself. Remember when I started, there was no internet or Google. And so now you have some tools. As for me, I still love the UN. I don't like flying. We're taking 30 hours, 0.5 flying hours for this trip. But you adapt and become flexible when you want to do something, you make it work. So I want you to pray for me tomorrow when I go to Porto Alegre. Um, I think the best message I can leave you with is to be very flexible and craft your own way into the UN and after the UN. I didn't have any idea that some organization called UNFP existed that eventually I made a career in it. After seven country assignments, one in headquarters, I'm still loving it. And more importantly, about the question about the family, my family still loves it. It took me a while to get them to love it, but eventually, yeah, and I think it's a, it's a great career, it's a great organization. You know, it's really, I mean, if I, if I would have been rich, I would have done it for free, but I have to work. <laughs> Susan. Um, I think my colleagues have said it. Be open to what you can give to the UN and what the UN can give to you, and also be idealistic. You know, be open to everything that the UN can offer you, be it going to Afghanistan tomorrow and then moving to Geneva and then back to New York. So really be motivated and open to all of the possibilities that the UN can offer you in terms of a career. And when you're being open to that, then you can be idealistic to encourage change in the world, to promote a better world. Okay, so now it's my turn. So my career in the UN. I think my career started when I was conceived. Um, my, I had the privilege, my father was one of those who was in San Francisco and prepared the charter. So uh, I have that privilege, although he never saw me in the UN system. And I was conceived in San Francisco. My parents went on honeymoon to San Francisco. So I think from then I was supposed to be in the UN. But my father died when I was a teenager and I joined the UN through a UN uh, advertisement. My life in the UN has been wonderful. I had to leave my country for security reasons. Uh, I was going to be kidnapped uh, for a, f a number of times, so we went to India, and I was three years old. So my life has been like that, and I think that has been what has helped me to join the UN and to love the UN. The UN is not perfect. It's not a perfect world. But if we look at the charter, I think each and every one of us will just say that's what we want to do and that is what we want to do in our lives. I have the privilege of being a manager and a leader and it's wonderful to have the opportunity of so many nationalities and of all ages. And in my team, Lynn is one of the members of my team, but today I have a wonderful team here. Each one with their own personalities, with their own challenges, and it's such a joy to come in the morning and be able to contribute to the world and make this a better place. I know that I may not be doing too much in New York, but I know there are someone in Afghanistan trying to help the, the, the girl having an education in Afghanistan. We have other people demining mines. So I know the more than 100 and 100,000s of people around the world are helping to make this a better place. Would I do it again? I would do it again. I may do some things differently, but I really would do it again. And on that note, I do wish to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We would like you to see you in our corridors sometime. It may not be you. And if it's not you, spread the word. The, the fact that you came to here to us is a motivation for us, and we go more motivated to go and work. So thank you to you, thank you for the ministry. We wish you wonderful careers, but more than careers, enjoy your life and make it the best of it. Thank you so much.